This is Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer, with your host, Mr. Gameplay Goodness himself, Stevie Stroud. All right. Well, here we are, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> without, You've been busy. <laughs> without any further ado, we're only uh, 14 minutes late getting the show started today, and uh, yeah, the network sponsors are going to have my head. Uh, <laughs> trillions of dollars are on the line here, and uh, I can just manage to screw this whole thing up. Yeah, so welcome to Coco Talk, Episode 21, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. And I am joined by a bevy of beauties here once again. I mean, I tell you what, not only is there incredible content here, but the eye candy on this show, I should be charging money for this. So, top left, L. Curtis Boyle from Canada. A, hey, how Hello. are you? We have Richard Cavell from the UK. We have Hello. Karen Anscombe from the Howdy. UK. Uh, Nick Morentes from Australia. Good day, everyone. Then we have Mark Overholzer from somewhere in the United States. Grant Leedy, David Ladd, Ron Delvo, and uh, Simon Jonasson from Denmark. Welcome, Simon. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Hey, there, Steve. And um, uh, 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 John Strong has been trying to get in and out of the call here. So hopefully we'll have John Strong um, show up here. Big West Purdue is in the chat. Hello, Big West. Big West says, damn straight. What's up, Stevie? Um, glad to have you here, Big West Purdue. So welcome to episode 21 of Coco Talk. We will talk about some things. Uh, the first thing I do want to talk about is the fact that if you... Um, if you only watch us on YouTube and you haven't been watching some other things I've been putting in social media, Coco Talk is now a podcast as well, meaning you'll be able to listen to Coco Talk. And we are available on iTunes, Google Play, wherever podcasts are sold and distributed, you can hear us there. And uh, we will eventually have all of our episodes caught up. What we do have for you there right now is episodes one through six. And Davey Mitchell is here. Hello, Davey. Richard Cavell in the chat, too. I've got two Richards. All right. Well, the real Richard Cavell, please stand up. Uh, so, yeah, we have episodes one through six. Episodes one through five covered everything leading up to Coco Fest. So we had a bunch of discussions. We had other things happen, but we were mostly like, we're all, yay, let's get ready for, let's get ready for Coco Fest. And then episode six was the wrap-up show of Coco um, Fest. Wrap-up show, too, talking about everything that actually happened at Coco Fest. John Strong, once again, trying to call in. John Strong, can you read me? Howdy. John Strong, this just in, ladies and gentlemen. My producer has told me that the satellite uplink has been restored and live via the International Space Station. John Strong, ladies and gentlemen. Yay. John, how's the weather up there? <laughs> how's the weather up there in outer space, John? Uh, cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Sun. So last week we reached a milestone. We reached 20 episodes, um, which was pretty cool, a pretty cool number. And we had our community discussions. We just, uh, you know, let's talk about whatever you want to talk about. That was pretty cool. We unveiled the Coco Talk Live t-shirt. We've sold nearly a half a dozen copies of that since that debut, which was pretty exciting. So by the way, too, yeah, Coco Talk merchandise available at our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com got to pay the bills people um but yeah so we sold a bunch of t-shirts which is kind of cool we'll have some picture some pictures of that simon says i sent you a disc on facebook now i need to try to get that when the time comes we'll, we'll try to get to that okay i've been not multitasking very well today so we're on episode 21 which means that coco talk is now old enough to drink so uh, have a pint everybody cheers <laughs> Oh, well, if you insist. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it's it's kind of cool. I've spent the past few days... Uh, Heineken. So there we go. Simon's drinking a Heineken. There you go. I spent the f past few days just doing a lot of groundwork to get these things ready for podcasts. I do want to do this real quick. I want to show you guys some, some feedback on what's been going on on uh, some of our shows and everything else. So let me switch over the screen here where you guys can see what I'm looking at here. And um, let's start by looking at some of the views on the most recent episodes of Coco Talk because the views here have been really um, 
really impressive. So last week's episode has gotten 206 views. That was episode 20, Community Chat, Ron's Garage. The world premiere of Ron's Garage, Forest of Doom trailer. All kinds of cool things happened there. Episode 19, Hardware, 259 views. Episode 18, an introduction to OS 9, 244 views. Episode 17, 186 views. The Mess, 154 views. Episode 15, Pac-Man Transcode, 192 views. Episode 13, 240 views. So you can see here that Coco Talk, um, the views have really been growing. So the show is growing, the buzz is spreading, and it's kind of cool. It's kind of exciting to do something that is so obscure. You know, who would imagine that, you know, 35 years later, people want to get together and talk about this machine, and, and you know, a couple hundred other people actually watch and listen to us talk about this machine. It says something about the machine. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. And we also got some feedback on some of the stuff here too. So let's go over some feedback real quick. Alan Huffman left a comment when I first posted that we're a podcast. He says, um, I see it in iTunes, but it tells me it's not available yet. I think that was the first day it, it posted. Yeah, it was kind of hit or miss. It came up in Canada first, of all places, right? Um, and then uh, it did show up in the, in the States a day later. So, yeah, we're available on iTunes. Uh, this was a question here, which I think this person also posted in the Facebook group. He says that now that Tandy is closing shop, um, how about working on The Last Ninja? <laughs> and I know that is a, that is a point of... Uh, of, of let's just say interest or lack of interest by a few members vitriol who, would probably who, be a bit better word. yeah so um, that was um, that was brought up and, and kind of dragged through the, the mill in the Facebook group for a little bit maybe we'll, when we get to our Facebook coverage later on today we'll look at some of that now this was interesting if you remember last week we had somebody in the chat claiming to be Neil Brookings his YouTube chat name was Neil Brookings but here's from John Linville himself host of the Coco Crew podcast. And John says, I talked to Neil Blanchard, a.k.a. Brookings. He was not the one in chat for this episode. Someone is an imposter. So <laughs> there is a Neil Brookings impersonator out there on the Internet somewhere. So uh, you know what? Guard your valuables, folks. That's all I can say. Yeah. Um, this one Actually, I thought it was the real Neil Brookings is who it was, I think. But. The Neil, the real Neil Brookings, right? Well, the real Neil Brookings, please stand please up. Please stand, yeah. Yeah, yeah please stand. Yeah, shady. <laughs> now, I was hoping one of you guys could answer this question because I didn't know the name of the game, but this person here, Crash Code, says, Hey there, Stevie. Have you ever played a Coco game that involves changing the plant and animal makeup of a planet in order to keep a sort of balance between CO2 and oxygen over time? Biosphere. Uh, it, what is it called? Biosphere. Okay, Biosphere. So, Tandy um, OS 9 game, actually. Okay, very cool. I'll have to remember to reply to that comment now called... Um, uh, biosphere. Uh, a comment on my video of Blockhead. Uh, this guy Ben Jamin says you deserve more subscribers. I'm a huge retro computer fan and collector myself. This was interesting too on my Bedlam video, which has gotten over 200 views now. Too Matt Toll says this game scared the crap out of me when I was a kid. Now I'm playing it on an emulator, and it's uh, still fairly creepy. I miss these old text adventures. Yeah, so John Strong trying to call in on Skype here again. I think there must be some sunspots up there in between the space station and Earth. Um, Steve Powell was asking about the OS 9 images. When can I get an OS 9 image? And I know there's a few out there, but I had basically mentioned once we get our kind of ducks in a row, I'll host some on my website and have them on my Coco Links page at uh, amacoconut.com. Um, I know Bill is still actively working on the one that he sent you. He's improving it and adding some stuff that was missing and fixing some stuff up. So, Okay, okay. Uh, a comment on a Coco Talk number 18. Uh, o Galapso says, someone asked where can I get Shanghai for OS 9? And he uh, posted a uh, link here. They're going to nitrous9.soundforge.io slash snapshot. There's an arcade pack, he said. So is that from the Nitrous 9 depo re depository, repository, whatever it's found? That's a source code branch for a Nitrous 9, I think. Okay. Um, Glenn Hewlett commenting on our hardware discussion saying, hey, this was a great video, Steve. Thanks again for making them weekly. And thanks to Bill and Jim Brain, uh, Bill Noble and Jim Brain. I, 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 Jim Brain, I learned a great deal from them both. I'm sorry, I missed it this week. And so on and so forth. So yeah, the comments are, are, are coming in. 
and that's kind of cool. It's just nice to hear from everybody. Nice to hear some some feedback from the things that we are doing. Um, really good. We got some few people in chat here right now. So Davy Mitchell says, "I found it okay on Pocket Casts." Very good. Uh, <laughs> Davy Mitchell says, "OS Nine is a big scary text adventure, isn't it?" <laughs> so what's been new and exciting with you guys this week? You guys, any guys got anything you want to talk about as far as? Oh, John Strong has a new bomb threat. Let me let me zoom in on this. Sorry, John. Okay, black and white bomb threat. Very nice looking. Is this 3D printed? Yes, this is just to encourage Rick to get his cartridge. Okay. <laughs> okay, Neil Brookings has just chimed in. And Neil Brookings says, I'm using my real name here. Why do you think I'm an imposter? I'm confused. Well, because we thought you were a different Neil Brookings. So maybe you are the real Neil Brookings. It's, yeah. And the, the real Neil Brookings has been on the Cocoa List and stuff for years. Um, when Tony Podraz accidentally called Neil Blanchard at Coco Fest Neil Brookings, he just confused ah. the two Neils. Oh, and we kind of made an okay. in joke out of it ever since. And Neil keeps calling himself Neil Brookings, and we've made little memes about it and stuff. But okay. the real one, I don't think, goes on Facebook, so he hasn't seen a lot of this stuff. So I think that's why. He's so maybe confused. this he's... is the real Neil Brookings, and I'm I apologize, sure it is. Neil Brookings. Yeah. I apologize. I didn't know there was a real Neil Brookings. The only Neil Brookings I knew about was the fictional character we created based off of the uh, the mis uh, the mispronunciation. Um, by the way, my last name does not have the letter G. Oh, it's Neil Brookins. Neil Brookins. There you go. Neil Brookins. Okay. He's been on the Coco list. He's been active on the Coco list for a while. So, like I said, I've, I have seen him before, and I think that's where Tony got the confusion. He just spaced out during the auction okay. between the two Neils okay. in his head. And, that, and we just kind of went and ran with it and made a running joke of it. So. Okay, so Neil Brookins, I apologize. You are the real Neil Brookins. The real Neil Brookins is here. The real Neil Brookins will stand up. And um, very good. Thanks for joining us. So uh, I apologize. I got distracted by that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, going around the room here, does anybody got anything that they did this week that was interesting that they want to talk about or share as far as projects or anything else? Get a haircut, get your nails did, anything like that? <laughs> The only thing I can really say in my case, I haven't had, I've been really busy with work, but yeah, I have been trying to help Bruce more a little bit. He's been just starting to dabble in Basic 9, and uh, it's, he seems to be kind of getting the hang of it, so it's, it's it's nice to see him, you know, picking it up, and he's got some definite ideas of some you know, game expansion stuff to do with that later. I'm really interested to see where he's going to take that. Very good. Very good. Helping the community is what it's all about. Okay, and um, this week I did set up to go to uh, BCF Midwest. Okay. And uh, I will be giving a presentation. Very nice. Uh, I don't know whether I'm going to get a table or not, but I did talk to uh, the other Neil. <laughs> okay. And if I can't get a table, we'll be put, putting my stuff at his, uh, his table. And uh, so uh, reserved the rooms. Uh, did that since I couldn't go to Tansy Assembly. And, uh, and I'll you miss just, you guys there. You uh, can't you convince your you just can't convince your family to to reschedule their wedding plans. Apparently, no, I I don't <laughs> think it's possible. <laughs> yes, I tell you, the priorities that some people have are amazing. Yeah, Bill had the same problem at Cocoa Fest where his brother got married the same weekend. He kept trying to change that too, and just didn't work out. Well, you know, I did outright ask, but I, I majorly had it. <laughs> and I got, <laughs> I got the uh, listings of the dates that was not available. <laughs> yeah. There Real are quick. there are 365 days in the year, and only one of them is Tandy Assembly, and they had to pick that one. <laughs> uh, VCF Midwest, you said there, John Strong? Yes. Okay, that's. I would love to attend some of these. You know, Coco Fest was the first vintage anything I've attended. Um, it's definitely interesting, uh, and I I could really get into doing this. I would love to get to the point where I'm making enough money on YouTube that I don't have to work and I could just go on tour and visit every freaking geek fest on the planet, you know, and just travel the world and see what all these things are like. I don't know that that's going to happen anytime soon, but yeah, since we have to pick our poisons and, you know, timing and scheduling and, and finances are always needing to be managed. Um, you know, Coco Fest is definitely my priority. And at this point now, uh, Tandy Assembly is another one. Um, very cool. Very cool yeah, stuff. We, so, we were definitely planning to go on the 10-day assembly, 
uh, until we uh, uh, were informed that that date was taken for us. <laughs> and uh, we did make the Midwest, uh, you know, BCF Midwest last year. And uh, it's very kind of more like a, a small ham fest. Uh, a little different feel and vibe than a Cocoa Fest. People have been to Cocoa Fest. But uh, you have a lot of different uh, computers there, some very interesting uh, talks. Uh, Dan Brain gave a very interesting talk last year there. And uh, so I thought I'd throw my hat in the ring and do a talk since I was going to be there. And uh, so. Um, yeah, kinda, yeah, that was good. the talk that we just recently aired as a podcast format was Coco Talk Episode 3, where you were kind of given a precursor to your speech from Coco Fest, where you were again talking about some of your projects you had in the works and your development tools. And it, to me, it's always interesting to hear um, from people like yourself and other people who are working on these things and kind of be a fly on the wall to uh, Neil Brookins is calling. Okay, Neil, I would love to have you join the call, but you need to add me as a friend first. Let me see if I can accept you. Hold on. I've accepted you. Um, Neil Brookins would like to okay hold on one second neil sorry trying to multitask some screens here neil hang up and try again try to call me right back because uh i needed to add accept your friend request first neil brookins not with a g but real brookins yeah so yeah it's always interesting for me to hear these things the way i kind of um give the analogy is that I've always been a big fan of when you watch a movie like a, a DVD and then you get the bonus content and the behind the scenes and you get to hear about how they did things I've always been a big fan of that and going back to like when Star Wars first came out Star Wars what 1977 I was a kid that blew me away and the movie was amazing and as soon as they started putting these specials on TV like well here's how we made the little plastic models fall across you know fly across the screen and we blew them up and all those kind of things ever since then I've really been interested in how things are made you know and there he is Neil Brookins the real Neil Brookins how are you Neil I'm doing good thanks very it's a pleasure to meet you and I apologize for confusing you for a fictional <laughs> character. <laughs> That's okay. This is actually my first time ever using Skype, so I'm not even sure. Is the camera on right now? The camera's yep. on, yes. Yep. Yeah, we see you how just fine. I, how come I can't see my picture? Oh, I can't. Uh, I don't know. I can't give you tech support right now. <laughs> it could be the mysteries of Skype. <laughs> the mysteries actually, of Skype. I had the same problem. Uh, try clicking on uh, Mark Overhoser because... Um, over Holzer because I, I got the pictures by clicking on Mark. Oh yeah, if, yeah. If you click on my if you click on my picture, you should see everybody. And here's Karen. Hey, Karen, just jumped in. Just jumped on video. Yeah, I tell you what, the eye candy in this episode, the um, the beauty per square inch. We are really, really starting to push the legal limits here. <laughs> <laughs> Do I need some hip boots? <laughs> it's getting deep in here hey perry perry uh i don't know how to pronounce your last name duick uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna screw that up like i do everything so hello perry's in chat yeah so i i like the behind the scenes discussions i like the technical talks so i've enjoyed yours i've enjoyed rick's i've enjoyed uh you know everybody's so um it is on my wish list and to-do list to visit more of these vintage computing festivals around the country and maybe one day around the world. And if anybody's never been to one, just to give you an idea, it's basically kind of like Comic-Con for old systems. You know, it's just a weekend full of people getting together and geeking out. You know, the only difference is I think there's a little bit less cosplay there. So um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Barry Nelson has just joined us in the Skype call as well. So anybody else got anything to report on what they've been doing this week as far as projects or things you've read about or heard about or anything we might find interesting? Not all at once. Hello? Hey, Barry. Hey. Oh, crap. You got your Barry, AM. A little bit late. At least I'm here. You got your AM radio connection again. Oh, Typically. Coming in on the AM you dial. Use what you have. Yes, it's Barry Nelson <laughs> on the AM dial here. 400 yards. Please turn right on Are you driving too? <laughs> and as usual, I'm on the road again too. All right. Um, if oh. you, you might need to silence that GPS. Or I'm going to smack her. <laughs> uh, 
I'll uh, I'll hit the mute bu- uh, mute call button here until I actually have something to say. All okay. right. Well, welcome to the call. You get the, you got the daughters with you too. Say hello, Leanne. Hi. Hello, hello, Leanne. Hello, Nelson family. <laughs> Thanks for joining hey, us. Say hello, Susan. Susan. Hi, Hi Susan. Hi, Leanne. Thanks for joining us. Okay, Perry says I've installed the Coco SDC and an awesome John Strong 3D printed case. Very cool. Nice plug for John Strong there. Uh, and his many, many um, uh, printed things. So, uh, Neil Brookins, since I have never met you before and this is your first time using Skype and your first time on Coco Talk, why don't you give us a little introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got started with computers back in the 80s and, and what you're doing now uh, to, you know, kind of continue the appreciation for the vintage hobby. And we can't hear you. I think you're muted, Neil. We still can't hear you. <laughs> you gotta love live broadcasts, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> You can, you're, you're still talking, and we still can't hear you, Neil. So what's the subject of this call? Uh, it's uh, Barry Nelson's AM radio station. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, seriously. No, we're just talking. We're, it's episode 21. We're talking about the fact that we are now a podcast, and um, we, we're, we're just doing a roundtable introduction right now. Oh, uh, okay. Well... I guess you already introduced my uh, my two daughters. Girls, you want to you want to talk a little bit about about uh, about uh, games on the color computer? Leanne says she's driving. She, Leanne is actually has she has her driver's license now, so she, I'm making I'm making her drive. Yeah, yeah. My daughter recently did that too. It, it's for it's actually not as scary as I thought it was going to be. So that's cool. Uh, what else do we want to talk about? So hopefully Perry, Perry, I mean, not Perry, but, um, Neil Brookins, we can't hear you. So hopefully you can hear us and hopefully you will come back to the call. Come back to us, Neil. Come back, Neil Brookins. Uh, Karen, how are you today, sir? Hi, I'm fine. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to share with us uh, as far as things you're working on or what's going on in the UK community or the dragon community? Um, very quiet. The uh, World of Dragon Forum seems to have seized up a little bit. Really? But what I'm doing is adding Q support to CAS files in XRO, which was suggested on there by uh, Rob CFG. Okay. Roberto, Carlos, something. I've forgotten the rest of your name. Sorry, Rob CFG. And what does that mean, Q files? Like uh, pauses between gaps on the tape or something? Pretty much exactly that, yeah. So CAS files don't represent anything other than zero bits and one bits and mm-hmm. the pause is just if you want to make them work right you normally just fill them in with more leader bytes so uh, add a bit of metadata at the end to describe extra features it's kind of like metadata for cast files or pretty much i think he named it q after the uh sort of cd burning formats Okay. You could okay. describe a CD in terms of sort of audio data and where it goes, lead in and that sort of thing. Yeah, it was a good idea. So, giving it a go. Uh, Richard Cavell in the um, YouTube chat is saying, "Thanks for making XROAR. It's a very convenient way of testing things when I don't want to use MAME. And also, thanks for a- for ASM sixty eight hundred nine, which is thankfully easy to learn." <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> No Very problem. cool. Very cool. Uh, all right, what's what's going on with everybody else? Anybody else got anything they want to talk about? They've been working on this week. Yeah, but Kieran needs to Kieran needs to turn around and say he helped me at breakfast this morning. Kieran yeah, that was to... that was a nice thing to wake up to. Genuinely, <laughs> it was. It was good fun. But... Yes, and you actually used LW tools as well. Indeed, <laughs> the competition. You have to admit, you used the competition with the cycle counts. I did, yeah, it's very good. Am I? Yes, I am. Still, still on. Yeah, no, it is good. Uh, that was that was quite fun actually, because you 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 traced some paths I didn't see. Ah, uh, new eyes, always good. Yeah, and it turned into madness, <laughs> as usual. 
Simon, I just I just downloaded your latest um, vector disk image, which we'll look at in a minute. Um, does that one have the old demos as well as the new ones? Uh, no, it doesn't. Okay, um, well then I just I just overwrote my old disks, but uh, the one that I've just downloaded we can look at in a little bit. I'd love to see your your latest demos. All right, so here's what we are going to do. We are going to pause for the cause right now. We are going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be back with more Coco Talk. Christmas is about families, and so is this computer, the Tandy 2500 RSX from Radio Shack. For the incredible price of $799.95, you get a 386SX 25 megahertz processor with 24 built-in programs for budgeting, word processing, and home education. With the power to run PC-compatible software, made in America by American families. Christmas, families, and the Tandy 2500 RSX, they go together. From Radio Shack, your Christmas electronics store. Something new is coming. Tandy Assembly. Tandy Assembly is about Radio Shack and Tandy Computers. Tandy Assembly is about interacting. Tandy Assembly is about people. Tandy Assembly is about fun. The first gathering of its kind. Computers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. All Radio Shack and Tandy makes and models. Join, Join us. us. Don't miss Tandy Assembly. In Chillicothe, Ohio. October 7th and 8th. Whether you're near or far. And the assembly is for everyone. Visit our webpage at www.tandyassembly.com. Tandy Assembly. Hey, guys. All right, well, we're back. How do you like that? So that's a little plug for Tandy Assembly there. And that's probably a good segue to go ahead and let's look at the latest goings on on the Tandy Assembly website right now because I believe a few things have changed. So let's take a look at the Tandy Assembly website right now, which um, by the way, it's tandyassembly.com. And if you're new to the show and you're not sure what Tandy Assembly is, well, it is much like many of these other festivals like the VCE, uh, what is it called? VCF, Vintage Computing Festival and Coco Fest. And now Tandy Assembly is the first ever festival um, that is dedicated to all of the Tandy computers. And this was kind of a, um, a, a combination of the Coco Crew podcast got together with the TRS-80 Trash Talkers podcast and the Floppy Days podcast. And they all kind of said, well, let's do all things Tandy, right? So uh, if you've had a Model 1, if you've had any, the, um, the uh, micro color computers or the Model 100 portable computers or even the later Tandy 1000s through 5000s, if you owned anything made by Tandy or Radio Shack, this is the festival for you. It is called Tandy Assembly. So here's the homepage of the Tandy Assembly website here right now. And let's take a look at what's going on in our speaker lineup. So uh, they've updated the website. So now we can see that we have our keynote speakers. So Scott Adams of Adventure International is one of our keynote speakers. Don French, inventor of the TRS-80, is one of the keynote speakers. And Lance Miklas is uh, one as well. And now we have some of our other speakers which have been updated on the website now as well. So we have John Linville. He's going to be doing a talk called Keeping the Coco in the Game. John Linville, host of uh, uh, Coco Crew podcast. Peter Satinsky is the host of, or one of the hosts of the TRS-80 Trash Talkers podcast. He is going to be giving a speech called "The History of the TRS-80 Model 2 Line." We have, I don't know, some ugly-looking dude here, Steve Strobridge, gameplay goodness, the origin story of OG Stevie Stro. That'll be a, a speech. And now here's a handsome fella here, Brendan Donahue. Hacking Coco Extended Color Basic for 64 column text with the Coco VGA. That's actually a pretty cool project right now. So that, that Coco VGA project's coming along pretty well. Uh, who do we have for sponsors right now? So we have Ian Maverick. He's coming down from Australia. He's also part of the Trash Talk podcast. John Benson featuring the world's largest TRS-80 collection, although I feel Ron Delvo might have him. Uh, give him a run for his money. Richard Lorbieski 
is going to be there. Brendan Donahue with his Coco VGA project. Jim Brain and Retro Innovations will be here. Look at this now. We are featured. Coco Talk is now featured as a sponsor. How do you guys like that? Negotiation tactics, people. And uh, Ron Dalvo, I can't add you to the call now. I don't know what happened. Floppy Days and Coco Crew in the TR City Trash Talk are all sponsors. Is there anything else that we need to look at here when it comes to uh, the exhibitor's floor plan? Has anything changed here? I don't know. To become an exhibitor, I think that's probably pretty good then right there. So we have... Um, we is we have uh, some some new updates to the um, Tandy Assembly website. So there's, we get some more speakers in line right now that we know that uh, uh, Richard says I'm on my phone. Uh, that's Richard Lorbieski. Ron, I don't know what happened to Ron, but Ron um, was trying to call back in and it's saying I couldn't add him as a call. So I'm not sure if he's um, I'm not sure if he's trying to call from a different account now or what. But we lost Ron, and I'm really looking forward to Ron's segment here in the near future. So, uh, which was kind of cool. You know, a lot of things in this show we haven't planned on. The show itself was an, a spontaneous decision. Hey, Neil, are you back? Yes, I'm back. Can you oh, hear me now? We can hear yeah, you. We can hear you now. <laughs> I had to. I had to kill the application and restart it because my button for mute and unmute wasn't responding. And after all I right, right. Now the button works. So it wasn't my fault. It was a hung app. There you go. We'll, we'll, we'll accept that. We'll, and you're <laughs> the second person to mention muting problems. Are you running an iPad version? or? This is on an iPhone 7, newest yeah. version of everything. Yeah, because somebody else had a problem with the mute button not working on early on the call, too. So I think there's a bug in that version of Skype. Yeah, but keep in Fingers. mind, this is my first call ever on Skype to anybody. So <laughs> it might have well, been just one of those things where, you know, the first time you try something on a computer, it doesn't always work right. Well, we're we're honored to have you, and and I'll repeat the question that we didn't get before. Do you mind giving us a little introduction, telling us a little bit about yourself? Um, you know, kind of a short history of your your you know '80s computing experience leading up to what you're doing now to support sure the hobby. Thing. Sure thing. So what I what I can start off with is saying that my first color computer too, or my first computer was a color computer too, and that was a 64K model with a floppy disk drive. And that would have been in 84, I guess, when 64K was um, first available. Um, actually, I had the floppy drive for about a month before I had the computer because I was waiting for the memory upgrade. Hmm. Um, so that was my first system, just two pieces, floppy drive and computer, um, hooked to the TV set in the, in the family living room. Um, I guess the next thing I got was a printer, also in the fa family living room and realized how much space it was starting to take up. So that's when we got my own television set and moved it into my bedroom so I wasn't taking up living room space anymore. Um, and then I think the next thing I added was a 300 baud uh, direct connect modem. Wow. And, um, and then I was on the internet back in the 80s. Um, so that was the color computer too. I used that for about four years. And then when I started college, that's when I got the Color Computer 3, and I also got a new monitor at the same time to support the um, high-resolution RGB mode that the older TVs couldn't support. Um, and I guess I used that Color Computer 3 for another four years or so, just like the four years before in the Color Computer 2, and that's when I got an MM1 after that. And the MM1, first of all, they back ordered the uh, the I.O. board. Um, if you've ever seen an MM1, you know there's two boards to it. There's a main board and an I.O. board. And the I.O. boards were back ordered for a long time, which meant you couldn't actually hook a hard drive up to it without the second board. So I used an MM1 for I don't know how long without a hard drive. And then eventually the I.O. board came out and I was able to hook a hard drive up and actually get some usefulness out of it. Because um, without that, there's not too much you can do. Um, and I um, used that. So that was my first, you know, three computer systems over the course of many years. And I guess just a high-level summary since then, I switched from OS 9 to um, Solaris, and I've been using Solaris ever since on Sun Microsystems computers. 
So hope that wasn't too long or too short. No, no, not at all. Uh, MM1, is that what you brought to Coco Fest a year ago, Curtis? Or was it the... No, I brought the TC9. TC9, okay. The MM1 was uh, Paul Ward and, and and Co, I guess, and, and then eventually Blackhawk Enterprises, I think, took over the last part of it. But it was one of the uh, three Coco 4s that was coming out after Tandy cut the Color Computer 3 off. And it was OS 9 based. And actually, it had the main windowing system that Kevin Darling, et cetera, wrote for it. Uh, the MM1 was the one that he was really supporting the, the most out of all of them. Right, David so, Ladd, I think. Didn't you have one MM1? Uh, yes, I have one. Um, and so it's I. not fully functional at the moment, but it's. Uh, it's. I still got it. <laughs> okay, let me catch if, up on. Let me catch up if on. If you were familiar ch- with doing OS9 development on the Coco Three, OS9 development on the MM1 was pretty much uh, the next generation, or you know, less constraints, but the same functionality. Did you do a fair bit of development on it then, Neil? Or I've done C programming on it, yeah, quite a bit. Um, the program that you might have used, if you've heard about it, is EBAC, which stands for Electronic Bible and Concordance. And I wrote that on MM1 and COCO3 and many other operating systems I ported it to. But I originally developed it on the MM1, originally as the first uh, release. Okay. And yes, I do use Sun computers at home. I saw the chat window there ah, asking me. Ah, neat, neat, very <laughs> cool. Yeah, I'm I'm running a Sun computer twenty four seven here at my house. Now that that's also at this point a kind of a vintage computer as well, right? Oh yeah, big time. <laughs> Is that like the Sun Spark Station or whatever it's called? Yeah, exactly. What kind of processor did that run on? Um. Well, when the original Sun computers came out, they were 6820s was the first generation. Well, no, I take that back. 6810s was the first Sun computer, then 6820s, then 6030s, and then they transitioned from the Motorola chips to a proprietary Spark chip that was only used in their computer. Um, Sort of like the Macintosh started off on the 68000 series Mm -hmm. and transitioned to um, PowerPC. Well, Sun Microsystems did the same transition, but to their own proprietary uh, Spark chip. And that's essentially what they've ever used ever since. They come up with new versions of the Spark chip every couple of years, but um, current Sun Microsystem computers today is still running on the Spark chip. Oh, wow. I didn't is that know a risk work. chip? Or? Actually, the newer ones are running on Intel. Well, it's I've both. Seen several... it's, it's the same operating system, but if you look at the inventory of what they sell, it's both Intel chip and Spark chip with a port of the operating system to both platforms. Oh, so they still sell the Spark stuff, huh? Interesting. Oh, yeah. I have, yeah, I have a rather unique... Spark. I have a rather unique Sun Spark system myself. I've got a couple of them. I've got one that uh, you've probably never seen. It's actually a Sun Spark processor laptop. I wow. actually have one of those. I, I have a Sun laptop computer. Oh, you do? Yeah, oh, those, yeah. Are, those are a little unusual. <laughs> that's pretty cool i didn't know they even still existed uh let me let me do a second here and try to catch up on some of the conversations that have been going on in the live youtube chat which some of these questions have already been answered but i i think i pronounced perry's name right perry duick says did the dragon computer have a color cycling cursor like the coco did and um so richard says i plan to speak on the SCART to HDMI and other video options at Tandy Assembly. Bill Noble says, hi all. James Ross says, hi all. Davey Mitchell says that the Dragon had the black and green flashing cursor. Um, Sixy, who's Karen, says, I love Suns. And Oracle, not so much, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they bought them out. Wow. Yes. Uh, interesting times. Um, this is a little anecdote there because I spent a couple of years working with companies that did visual effects development and most of the visual effects development, even now, most of that pipeline and most of those workstations are running Linux. And I believe 
um, part of the legacy of why they're doing that is because a lot of, there was a time when the Sun Spark workstation was one of the only computers that you could do like serious graphics and animation on. It was considered to be kind of a powerhouse for its time, if if I recall. And so some of the older companies, like when Pixar started, you know, eons ago, that was about all they could run to get this type of you know production going. And that legacy has continued now on basically. Um, you know linux based pcs but most of the stuff we see on and in, uh, in the motion pictures that that whole pipeline is a linux based pipeline which is interesting is a so so i was wondering if anybody has had a chance to look at the new main binary that uh, i put up for macintosh if anybody's run that yet i haven't had a chance to i haven't tried it yet it's in my queue, but it's 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 going to be a while yet. <laughs> okay, because it's got the it's got the floppy disk fix, and it's still got the speech synthesizer and stuff like that. I actually backported the patch because I don't necessarily always take the latest version of the main source code. So the patch that fixed the, fixed the floppy disk issue for the color computer, I backported that to the source I had and applied it, and then built a binary with it. And what version of MAME is your current? Um, distribution running on? It's running on the, uh, it wasn't a full release, it was running on the version of the source code that was right after they applied the speech synthesizer updates and added that into the source tree. I think that was 187. Yeah, well the, the version stamp on mine still says 186. Hmm, okay. Okay, I could so, be a little off in my, in my recollection too. Well no, no because they hadn't updated that's why I said it was it was pulled from the Git source, so they hadn't updated the version number yet for the next major release. But they had the speech synthesizer stuff in the source tree at that point. So that's what that's what I built off of, and I've been uh, testing that for the a bunch of. You know, I, I basically test the Commodore, the Tandy, the Amiga, and a bunch of the other uh, popular systems, and try to make sure they're stable. And when I heard about the issue with the floppy drive, which was pretty serious, it can uh, corrupt floppy images. I uh, was tracking, I started posting suggestions and working on that, and then when they came out with a fix for it, I backported that patch into my release, and then re-released it. Okay. Maybe we can get, da David, you're with us, right? <laughs> David Ladd, are you there? Okay, because Richard, Richard Cavell in the chat saying, while we're on the subject, I think we need to come up with a standard disclaimer uh, for the prior versions of MAME that have the bug, since most of the distros will be using um, prior versions by default. So, yeah, it's probably good to talk about that. And uh, um, David, are you there? I see a picture of your face, but I don't hear your voice. <laughs> Must have Did he break his microphone? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. It, it might be good to have David do that. And um, Grant Leedy and Ron, are you still with us? We lost Ron. So w what we're gonna what what's happening over time is that the show is kind of evolving, and I think we will start to have some regular segments. And so one of the segments that kind of happened spontaneously last week, and like almost everything in the show has been fairly spontaneous. But we had Ron Delvo show us some of his collection. We got a peek into Ron's garage, and and Ron's been posting a ton of photos on Facebook. So um, it's it would be kind of cool to have Ron's segment. Uh, Grant has mentioned he wanted to come up with like the the newbie question of the week. I don't know if you have a question for us this week, Grant, that we that you can ask and we can get some people to chime in on. Uh, yeah, I guess I got one. Um, uh, since I was uh, doing some uh, work here a couple weeks ago and uh, was showing off the uh, Popstar Pilot, um, Nick said I needed to get a, a real monitor. So the question is, which uh, Curtis has helped as well and some other people, but I want to bring it up for everybody else who doesn't know. Um, what is a good monitor to get? Because the CM8 is not the best monitor out there. Um, and plus, on top of that, I hear they can get like the Magnavox and uh, the NEC monitor. Um, so if I find one on eBay or at Tandy Assembly, how do we get that connected to the Coco? Is there cables that need to be purchased? Well... Well, I, well, I, for a shameless plug, 
developed, I recommend you use a modern H. Oh darn my GPS. <laughs> uh, I, I recommend you use a, a modern HDI monitor, a HDMI monitor, and uh, build an HDMI to SCART cable, and uh, or I'm sorry, an RGB to SCART, and then get an, uh, a SCART to HDMI converter. Did you follow that, Grant? Yes, I did. Okay. And then what if, what if I if I find a uh, Magnavox or a NEC monitor that's uh, compatible, and I just want to get a cable? Is there a way to do that? Uh, well, if finding cables for those things these days, you generally you're going to have to build a cable anyway. Um, if you want to go with a, a, a vintage legacy monitor like that, you know, you're going to have to find one that doesn't have too many hours on the CRT, and then you're probably going to have to build a cable unless you're lucky enough to find a CM8 that's in good shape. And is CRT the best way to go still, or are we losing anything by going to uh, a VGA or to a LED? Well, like I said, I strongly recommend, you know, the HDMI solution that I've got. Um, the cable and the converter is very cost effective. The converters are mass produced because um, curse you, GPS. <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the, the, cable, the, the, the converters are mass produced because they uh, are, you know, produced for escort interfaces. Are still used some places in Europe, and there's still equipment to use them, and they were used for other than just, you know, a niche, you know, which is the color computer. So the escort to HDMI converters are readily available and they're cheap. And then the cable just uses a couple connectors and some passive components. Okay, cool. Well, get, to get back to your question, though, I don't think that there is a answer of what's better because it's really a matter of your preference. What kind of experience do you want to have? If you want to have a more uh, authentic 80s-like experience, then a CRT is more period correct, you know, but it's really... I, I, what, I, what are you looking for? Are you looking just to get a good quality picture on a screen or are you looking for a more authentic you know, experience, you know, and, and that, that answer is going to depend on each person, you know. I, I have to agree with what Stevie Stroh just, just said. You know, I mean, it is, you know, it depends on what you want. You know, a, a vintage monitor is going to be more hassle to set up and it's going to be, you know, expensive and difficult to locate. But if that's what you know, if you want a CRT, authentic CRT and know what it looked like, etc., and you want to duplicate that setup, then, you know, that's what you got to go and get. You know, because, you know, whereas an HDMI monitor with an LED or LCD, it produces a very, very, very nice picture. It's not the same as what was on a CRT back in the day. You know, as it was blending between the pixels and whatnot. But if you're really looking to duplicate that, then you need the original CRT. Okay. Yeah, I prefer to keep uh, the authentic and keep it was like back in the day with the uh, CRT if possible. But, you know, those days are are definitely coming uh, harder and harder to find. So what about some of these uh, VGA projects uh, that I've seen, like through Cloud9 and so forth? I like the Spectro. Cloud9 has, a, yeah, Cloud9 has an excellent adapter called the uh, Spectro. It sells for 100 and something, I think. Right. And it's a, a very good solution. Um, that one even does the composite I, colors too, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so so does the so does my HDMI. It actually passes through the composite and converts that to, to uh, HDMI as well. I'm going to bring up their website real quick. Um, so yeah, so what they do is they convert the, the composite colors and they and they uh, simulate them on uh, VGA. So and it's an excellent solution if you've got a VGA monitor that's handy that you want to use. Um, it'll convert the 15 kilohertz. Color, uh, color computer's RGB signal to uh, a 31 kilohertz uh, VGA signal that a standard VGA monitor can display. You know, it costs, it costs about $100, 100, 100 and something dollars. I forget the exact price, but something like that, I think. Um, uh, the Spectro is not listed on the Cloud9 website. I had a look for it. I'm looking yeah, for it right now. Yeah, I think he now. pulled it off until his next run is ready because he was sold okay. out. Okay. Yeah, let me. Uh, I'm going to bring up Cloud9 right now. I'm going to show you what is on the uh, website right now. So if you go, it's cloud9tech.com, and there's a link to this on my uh, Cocoa Links page too. I'm a coconut.com. 
There is a Coco 3 video monitor cable. They have a Magnavox uh, monitor adapter cable for $22 that um, would convert that for you. It's got an NEC multi-sync conversion cable, and then there's even a Commodore 64 one. So on, on Cloud9's website, there's a handful of cables that, um, that are already available. So this also then gets into what is your skill set and what is your preference, because any of these cables could be created right so uh but i'm not that guy i'm not the solder crimp make a cable kind of guy and i'm i'm much more of let me paypal you and i'll have it in a week kind of guy so <laughs> if you if you have the skills or the interest and it's like a hobby it's like hey i've never made a cable let me just try this because you know that might be something you want to do as well um, but yeah so it looks like the, to answer one of your questions if you get a neck multi-sync or, or magnavox monitor for you know, roughly twenty dollars plus shipping, you could have the cable to adapt it to your Coco Three. Um, yeah, and that's another thing. That's another thing to consider. For instance, for my SCART cables, very cost effective, but I don't produce them, and neither does anybody else yet. Um, so if you want to build it, the schematic is out there, but you have to buy the connectors and pretty much build it yourself because nobody is mass producing them. Um, the Spectro is when they do another run is going to be a mass produced unit that's ready to go you know so i mean it's, it's it depends on what your resources are how much skill you have for soldering um how much money you have you want to spend on it and what type of experience you want to get you know yeah. those are i guess the three things to really consider about monitors ron are you with us you've kind of come in and out of the call are you are you with us right now ron Delva? I yeah, see he was in for a bit there. Bill Noble joined us. Bill, are you here? Yes, I am. All right, welcome to the call, Bill. Welcome to Coco Talk. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I am going to take a quick commercial break, and then we will come back, and then hopefully we'll hear from Ron. Looks like Ron just faded off the call again, too. So we'll be back in just a minute. This is a word from our sponsors, and don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for more Coco Talk. Typing away. Actually, I was muted. We're Stevie Stroh here, and when you're done with Coco Talk, if you gotta have more cowbell, then head on over to my YouTube channel for your share of gameplay goodness. There you will find over 1,300 family-friendly gameplay videos. Everything from the old school to the next gen, and over 200 color computer gameplay videos, as well as interviews and replays of Coco Talk. So if you need your share of gameplay goodness, then check out the original gamer Stevie Stroh on YouTube at youtube.com slash OG Stevie Stro. We're traveling to a dimension. We're traveling to sound and ideas. We're at a place where the mind can comprehend and defies a solar radio. A wireless transmitter. Measured time and light. 65 electronic projects brought to reality with this science fair kit. Astonishing, perhaps. But you can find it for Christmas for $17.95 in a place that's known as Radio Shack. Radios, stereos, recorders, everything in sound. All right, we're back. Yeah, I've uh, been scouring the internet for vintage Radio Shack commercials to not only spice up the podcast, but also give us something else to watch here, too. So I thought that one was really cool. That was Rod Serling introducing Twilight a Zone. Radio Shack home electronics kit. Oh, did you a, see the links? I think it was Siren put in the Skype chat. There's uh, some Dragon commercials I think he was mentioning. Oh, I did not see those, but I'll grab them. I'll have to do it um, later on. I don't have time to do that now, but thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll have to but just, just you know it's there, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. We want to include that as well. So, Ron, are you back? In a quarter of a mile. Ron Delvo, are you with us? Ron looks like he's in the call. <laughs> Perry Perry says I love that old uh, Radio Shack logo. All right, well while we're waiting on uh, to see if we can get Ron back, let's go ahead and take a look at what's going on this week in Facebook, and that'll be a good segue for us to look at Simon Jonason's demo here in just a second. So uh, I'm going to switch over, and uh, we're going to take a look at the Facebook group. Here's here's Richard. Richard, are you with us? Okay, I'm here. 
Hey, Richard hey. Lorbieski, how are you? Welcome to Coco Talk, the nation's oh, yes. leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry I'm running late. I, I was hearing you guys talking about the SCART cable and stuff, and I was in my car and I couldn't talk. So and I finally got home and I rushed in and got on Skype. So I don't know if you guys had moved on with the conversation well, or not. Well, we can, we, can, we can revisit that topic. And by the way, being in the car hasn't stopped Barry Nelson, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I heard him. <laughs> Yeah. I, I tried. You know, <laughs> that's the only way I could get on this call. So, you know. <laughs> priorities. Now we know exactly where you're going. <laughs> yes, we, uh, we we're glad you have your priorities in order, Barry, and we're we're, we're glad to have you in the Nelson Louders with us. Yeah. So. No, no yeah, waiting excuse for him. <laughs> and, and he knows how to take the puns too. And and here's David Ladd finally giant chimed in. We've been trying to get you to answer us, David. Um, very cool. When was yeah. that? Uh, when, don't worry about it. We'll 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 call on you again in a minute. So yeah, Richard, uh, enlighten us more because the question that Grant Leedy just asked a few minutes ago is: If I have a Coco Three and I want to get RGB output, what are some of my options? So and that you mentioned you're going to be speaking in Tandy Assembly just about this. So go ahead and uh, share your wisdom with us. Oh, okay. Yeah, the SCAR cable base. It's based on uh, Barry's design. Uh, there's just going to be a couple enhancements. Uh, one of the things I'm I've been toying with was that uh, five volt line uh, is trying to get something uh, very consistent because uh, not all uh, USB is the same voltage. So, uh, and I've looked at other designs, and I'm probably uh, going to go with 180 ohms. He has uh, 100 ohms listed on his. Uh, either one will work. Uh, and then the other enhancement I just started with is uh, I taken the left and right audio. And it's going to be separated so you can actually hook up an Orchestra 90 or any other uh, stereo device. And that will actually go through your HDMI. Um, if you have sound for the HDMI, it will actually go through it. It will pass through it. Okay. Uh, to give you some uh, uh, background on the SCART, it was developed in France back in the 1980s. What did they? Uh, France wanted to do was to take the existing technology, uh, audio and video technology, and make it into one cable. They didn't want several cables in the back, and so they dictated uh, this SCART standard, and it just uh, grew in Europe, and it was very popular in Europe. It never, it never uh, became popular here in the United States. And then Japan also had one, but it's a different standard. It's the same connector, but different pinouts. Okay. Les SCART. Oh, oh. But the Viva, Viva les yeah. SCART. <laughs> the other advantage of the SCART to HDMI is like uh, what Barry said, it's readily available, it is cheap, uh, very you know inexpensive. Uh, the converters can run anywhere from $30 to $500, depending on what kind of converter you get. Uh, I am trying to mass produce the cables. It's just basically trying to find good sources and trying to keep the price down because... Uh, I'm trying to keep it down to under thirty dollars, and okay. I'm hoping that I will have some available for Tandy Assembly to sell. Nice. Uh, but um, the uh, the other advantage with SCART is not only can you hook it up with the Coco, but you can hook it up with other retro gaming machines like the Amiga. You can hook them up to the NES, the Sega Genesis, uh, any of those uh, equipment. There's several that use the RGB standard. Okay. And they could be converted over to HDMI as well. Interesting. Very interesting. That's yeah, cool. That includes like the Atari ST and a few others too then, wouldn't it? Right. Yes. And like Barry had mentioned, it can also take composite directly and convert, up convert it as well. Uh, unfortunately, the composite for the Coco 3 is really crappy. And, yeah. Uh, Really crappy, and it, it and it's and it's not it it's really bad on the uh, HDMI. It's I, I I would never I don't recommend composite on a Coco Three. Right, is that just because it's progressive, where no neither NTSC or PAL, the the standard, they sort of dictate interlace. It's it's not only that. It's just that you can't really improve on it because a lot of the timing signals come directly from the Gimme chip and. We don't really have any good specs on, you know, the the inside. Now I know that they're coming out with a Gimme clone with the VGA uh, port to it, and once that is done, that would actually really open a lot of doors up. Yeah, yeah I'm looking be forward to that project. You know, and we, when we're talking about just getting back to Grant's question earlier, 
you know, what what did the Coco 3 have? It had an RGB output, right? Which is fairly standard and and um, there are ways to convert that directly with a passive cable to other RGB monitors of the era. And then there are ways with a box uh, that requires some DC power to convert it to something like VGA. And in my opinion, VGA is also a little bit of a dying standard as well because uh, less and less monitors now have VGA connectors on them, if you think about it. So um, the idea of, of outputting to HDMI is at least, uh, you know, I don't want to use the word future-proof, but at least it's present appropriate for in just about every computer monitor and television has an HDMI output. And like you mentioned, you get audio and video from a single cable. So if you're just looking for a way to get a good-looking um, RGB picture from your Coco and you're not concerned about you know the CRT and the old school feel then yeah that's probably your best your best bet um, yeah I want to add more about the RGB specs it's uh, it's a analog RGB and it's 15 kilohertz uh, signal uh, most other uh, game devices use the 24 kilohertz the same same thing as an analog RGB but they were but it was anywhere from 15 to 24 kilohertz. And the modern ones are 31 point something kilohertz. So it's uh, yeah, it's a little bit different. Interesting, interesting. Ron, are you back with us? Ron has come and gone. Ron's having some issues today with Skype. All right, well, we're going to get back to what I was getting ready to look at here for just a minute. Is let's take a look at what's going on on the on the Facebook page. And maybe it's time before we go into Facebook. Let's do a quick another commercial break. So we're going to pause for uh, a word from our sponsors, and then we're going to see what's going on in the Facebook group. Be right back. Hey guys, Stevie Stroh here. And if you're a fan of vintage computing and retro gaming, you're going to love our retro swag shop at 8bit256.com. Featuring hand-drawn custom designs and pixel art by Instagram artist Joel M. Adams. We've got the brand new official Coco Talk t-shirt, I'm a Coconut t-shirt, and all kinds of other cool video game and arcade related artwork. Check out 8bit256.com for all your retro swag needs today. Computer shopping has never been better at Radio Shack. Here's proof. Our new ultra-high-performance 386SX 20 megahertz computer with 85 megabyte hard drive, only $12.99. And it's from Tandy, manufacturer of the best-selling PC compatibles in America. Or get a 286-based Tandy home office computer with color monitor and hard drive, only $899.95. Shop your friendly nearby Radio Shack. Great selection, superior service. Nobody compares. All right, we're back. And uh, yeah, Radio Shack Technology Centers. Nobody compares to Tandy Technology. I think we'll all agree there. So um, I think one of the funnest things that I, uh, part of my day, and that's really bad English, right? One of the funnest things, uh, one of the things that gives me the most joy in life, I should say, is when we head over to uh, the Color Computer Facebook group and we look at what's going on and who's posting things here. Like this is where we're always going to see Simon Jonasson's latest um, demos and things that he's working on. He's going to post a video and whatever mad creation he's come up with. James Ross right now has a poll saying, what type of compiler would you like to see written for the Coco? Um, uh, especially if we're going to do a development on a modern computer, what language would you prefer? And it's looking like right now C Sharp is winning out on that poll. Uh, here's here's Simon's demo, which I will also show off here in just a second. But well, this is not the most recent one, but this is one of Simon's Cube demos, and we we showed this last week a little bit. Uh, he's got it to the point now where there's no double buffering, or there's double buffering, there's no flickering, and it's very smooth and it's optimized. And hopefully, we'll look at the latest one today too, because he sent me a disk image. We'll we'll pull that up on a real Coco. Uh, there is uh, Travis Pope is talking about an ultimate SDC image and this topic has been brought up a few times in the past what is the ultimate Coco SDC image and I believe the definition of ultimate probably varies on the individual and what their tastes are and for me the ultimate would be every game ever written you know some other people would be nitrous nine in every development tool so um, what do you guys think on the ultimate SDC image what, what would be the holy grail of everything to have on your Coco SDC all of the above. 
every game ever written, every development tool and environment ever written, every, Nitrous every, 9. Every single you, you, Nitrous 9 command ever made, yep, a whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have more stuff. So that might be worth interest uh, looking at. Here's me plugging the podcast. Here's uh, Randall Kindig pl- uh, plugging Floppy Days uh, 76 interview with Ian Maverick. Uh, Ian Maverick is the guy from Australia who makes a lot of cool hardware boards for different systems. Uh, here is a picture of, uh, and I wish I could pronounce this guy's name. He's told me before I don't remember. His, uh, the letters of his name don't look like American symbols. So, But he's got the Coco 3 with this looks like the, um, yeah, the Cloud 9 triad board. So we have a happy Coco 9 upgrader here. Very cool. Uh, here is Carlos Camacho talking about a oscilloscope kit. So I guess you could run this on your computer. I guess you use your computer as the actual scope. Um, cool stuff. Here's uh, Simon showing some of his assembly code. And what else? And so here's uh, Ed Snyder showing some of his stuff where he's converting images to run on the new Coco VGA project from Brendan Donahue, right? So um, very cool. So there's all these new modes. And, and this is too. So getting back to one of your earlier questions, Grant. Uh, well, you have a Coco 3, but what if you want to make a Coco 2 a little bit more modern compliant? Well, that's Brendan's project where he didn't stop at just making it VGA out. He's added all these extra modes, these graphics modes, these color modes. And uh, so this is a picture of Ed Snyder taking some images and then converting them to show up on the um, Coco VGA project. And that's stunning if you ask me. I mean, it's just really cool. Yeah, like that's showing off the 128 by 96 16 color mode. And he's made his modes so they can fit within the same 6K limits that the, the you know the Coco 2 by Maxim could normally use. And he's also done extended text modes like a 64 by 32 column screen and stuff too. So he's it's almost like making it into a mini Coco 3 at this point. <laughs> yeah, right. This is kind of a cool picture here too. So this is uh, this looks like a similar Raspberry Pi case for a Coco. This one looks similar to like the one I got from Glenn Hewlett. Um, and it's even got the little um, black cutout around the keys here too, which looks more like a Coco where the Coco had that like, kind of keyboard bezel, that um, thing. And so then the question came up here. Um, uh, somebody asking the question about, has anybody thought of doing a Raspberry Pi project or a Retro Pi project for the Coco? And we know the answer to that. And if we have time today, I'll, I'll be, I wanted to do this with Ron Klein because Ron Klein is kind of the expert and the spearhead on this. And maybe Rick, if Rick's still here, he can help us too. But I can at least boot up my Coco Pi and show what that looks like. So that was kind of cool to see that. What was this discussion here where they're showing how we're, somebody was proposing to use a Coco for a car computer? Did anybody read that one? I saw the picture. I didn't get a chance to read the article yet. I, I, I thought, didn't get a chance to either. I just thought that was a really interesting thumbnail. Here's a guy, Mike Moore, who has a picture of a lot of his retro systems here. So you can see here he's got like a, a Dreamcast, a GameCube. He's got a PlayStation. He's got uh, looks like a Sega Saturn, a, a Genesis, Super Nintendo, original PlayStation down here, and uh, 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 ColecoVision. And then on the top shelf, he's got uh, looks like an Atari 2600 next to a Coco, next to an NES, next to a Sega Master System. So this guy's got a bunch of... 80 systems and he's proudly mixing in his cocoa on his shelf of cool 80s tech so that was pretty cool he'll want one of those scart cables (laughs) (laughs) this another ed snyder picture here showing how he's converting some of the images on his mac to run over to the Coco, and of course they picked the hot chick from Deep Space, uh, was it uh, Star Trek Voyager or Deep Space Nine, one of those shows. Um, um, Voyager, and it was Seven of Nine. Seven of Nine, thank you David, <laughs> thank you for cor- correcting us there. So there she is on the Coco itself, I think, uh, looking quite Seven of Nine-ish, if you ask me. So yeah, I love seeing this kind of stuff. It reminds me of the old days when uh, when GIFs were the thing, and everybody would just download a bunch of GIFs and you'd run a GIF slideshow on your computer. That was before we had the ability to play videos and stuff. That was kind of the cool thing. Um, this is an interesting little uh, tidbit here. Microsoft has announced Coco Framework, a system designed to speed up blockchain technology while allowing more control over data privacy. Coco slated to be released as an open source product by 2018 will be free as an uh, enticement for enterprise to use Microsoft Cloud Services. So that's kind of funny that Microsoft's doing a new Cocoa service. Uh, that was pretty cool. 
So um, uh, here's a picture of the Curtis Boyle interview. So this is this has been kind of fun too, right? So in the process of taking our old video episodes and converting them to audio, uh, I'm trying to do a few different things. I'm trying to add some value added content. So I've been adding all kinds of cool commercials and things like that. But I also am going to be adding some of our interviews because I figure if somebody's going to listen to things, they might want to hear an interview. This was the first interview I did with Curtis. So for guys, for those of you who don't know our history, uh, I wish I had some uh, dramatic romantic music to play right now. But um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I, I started doing YouTube videos. Most of you guys who know me now know that, right? So I just started playing YouTube videos, playing color computer videos, and I'm just some idiot playing games, right? So Curtis was one of the people who started leaving me comments on my video saying, hey, idiot, uh, this is really what you should be saying. No, he was not rude. He's Canadian. Canadians aren't rude. It's against the law. But, you know, he gave me actually very helpful information and shared his website that's you know color computer games list website and everything else so it started off as kind of us commenting back and forth and i don't remember what prompted it but curtis we skyped one time and then you mentioned hey since you're into games i've got these really cool controller yeah, collection joysticks and, joysticks and stuff and so so curtis was technically the first person from the color computer community that I interviewed. And so we recorded the interview and it's on there. You can watch it right now on my YouTube channel. But what I had done at the time is I actually edited out probably about 10 minutes of that um, interview because I was thinking back then, listen, this is a gaming channel. People aren't going to want to hear us getting too techie. So I think I cut out a bunch of the techie talk and especially more OS 9 type stuff. And so uh, all that stuff was on the chopping room floor. Uh, and But I had the original recording. So what you can now hear on the podcast is you can hear the entire interview, which has got like an extra 10 minutes and it gets more into some history of OS 9 and a few more technical things too. So that was that's kind of a cool uh, other benefit of... Um, you know, doing this podcast is I can um, re-air things in another format. And, and a lot of these interviews, I think, will play well to audio, too. So yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing how many people are viewers will become listeners and vice versa to see how our numbers are right now. Right now, we're, new, we're averaging on a new episode about 200 views per week, which is a nice number. But it'd be really interesting to see how um, our viewership can turn into listenership and how maybe new people will find us through iTunes and stuff and possibly become viewers. So as we track this, it'll be really interesting to see. But yeah. I listened to that in the car, and, and I like listening to it again. That's when you had your crappy microphone, Curtis, <laughs> yeah. if you remember. So yeah, the one his, Mark uh, bugged me about. His, his, his tin can mic, you know, so there's not a lot we can do about some of the audio on that. And um, another thing, too, is the way these things get recorded, it's one recording. I don't have different tracks. I don't have one audio track for Skype and one audio track for me, so I can't mix anything. What you hear is what you got. There's going to be limited things I can do to clean up the podcast, but... It's free, people. Take it, take it for what it's worth. Uh, Ron, are you back? Yeah, I had. Um, I was in my uh, observatory. Your observatory. And it's like, uh, Ninety-eight degrees in there, and the computer overheated. So I tried ah. the desktop I had out there, and it didn't work. Okay. So I'm back well, to inside the house. Are you able to do your segment and show us some of your yes. cool vintage stuff? All right, so I want to apologize. Well, let me do this. I'm going to do it ghetto, okay? You have created a very cool piece of uh, artwork for your segment. So let me find that and pull that up. And then... Well, it's right on the um, your website. Listen, Ron, don't confuse me with the facts, okay? Um <laughs> <laughs> I prefer yeah, alternative Steve facts. Easy to confuse. Confuse. Yes, I am yeah. much more interested in alternative facts. So, well, on Facebook, I mean, it should be there. Oh, it's look at that! Look at that! He's holding it up on the screen. So let's do that real quick while I stumble to find it. Here's Ron's image. I'll find it here in just a pic in just a second. Now I don't have the observatory one, but we'll we'll live without Sorry. the because you're not in your observatory today. No. Nope. Okay, so bear with me two more seconds as I stumble to manage my technology here. All right, so here's Does your... Do you know who it uh, was that designed the uh, Coco there that did the original artwork? It's really nice. Yeah, I think that's Sockmaster. Okay. Yeah. Is it? Yeah. yeah John so, so once a week now we're gonna fe we're gonna have a segment where we're gonna feature some of Ron Delvo's uh, color computer and, and vintage computer collection. What do we want to call your segment, Ron? Uh, Ron's uh, collection segment. <laughs> I don't All right, know. so hold on. <laughs> uh, 
It's time for Ron's Collection segment featuring Ron Delvo. Take it away, Ron. I think we should call it Old Crap I Found in My Garage. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff I collected on the cheap. All right. Well, you are full screen. And for those of you who will be listening to this later, you won't be able to see it, but we'll try to give you some play-by-plays and what we're looking at. Uh, I thought maybe we would uh, run that video of the um, Computer Fest and um, everybody can chime in about interesting uh, things. They- and where is that now? You you are correct and I forgot. That's is that on, on the website f- also. On which website? When you say it's on the website, which website are you talking about? The Coco. Press 80, Color Computer. Ah. Uh, you're, you're talking about the Facebook page? You're breaking up on me a little bit, Ron. Are you talking about what's on the Facebook? What, what website is on? Yeah. Down the ways. Down, down. Keep going. All right. Yep. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. You got to love this, huh? Nothing like a live show where everybody's <laughs> prepared and on top of stuff, right? The audio okay. listeners are just loving this part. <laughs> this okay. will get edited out. Just to describe, we're scrolling through Facebook. We're scrolling <laughs> through. There's Ron's <laughs> artwork. Uh, back in 1984, I... Um, there it is. There it is. Okay. okay. We got it. We're going I, live. I'm people. a sign painter by trade, so uh, I made the sign. Let's see it. Okay, I'm going to try to make this uh, full screen if I can. Here we go. You could probably turn the sound down because it's just... An old, Here we old go. camera I used. That looks cool. Welcome to Computer Fest. Yeah. It was the North Town Mall in Toledo, Ohio. <laughs> Look September. at that dot matrix printer. Yep. I still got it. It's in the garage. EMP 110. <laughs> and there and this- was out something. This was our club, the Greater Toledo Color Computer Club. They had about uh, 80 to 100 members. We had um, kinds, of different kinds of people in there. We had some girls in there. <laughs> girls. <laughs> nice. Yes. They weren't real geeks then. <laughs> yeah. And nobody's walking around with their smartphone. Yeah, right? But they would have had them if they were available. Yeah, there's yep. my computer setup. That's the one nice. I originally bought in 83 for uh, 350 bucks. They wow. Have a TV. a Every- silver cocoa with a silver multi-pack. Nice. How many years did this uh, fest run? Um, it, as far as I know, we, we only did it the one time. Uh, it got to be, uh, it was a big chore. A lot of people had to dedicate their time most of the day, and uh, they said they weren't going to do it again. Model there's, one. There's an 800 pound printer I had. Wow. My Coco one, or my. Uh, m- model one. There's a Coco two. Yeah. yeah. Multi pack, double floppies. How are you living? It's a, it's a daisy wheel printer, I think, there. I and we tried it. doing the same thing of having a show on the mall, and we we ended up doing I think two, and that was as far as we went. Yeah, there's a CGP two twenty there. Oh, the color inkjet. Yeah. yeah. And that guy had a hit camera set up. Um, there's the DS sixty nine, and then there was another kind. Do you guys remember what the name was? For Coco one and two days. Yeah. Well, Coco three even. Um, yeah, well, Coco uh, three. Nick Marentes did one. He did um, Digiscan or Rascan. Digiscan. Yeah, Rascan. That that guy there was uh, uh, president of the Tatsig Club, I think. The um, Toledo area Tandy user group. They they were just um, anything but Coco. What year was this video? Eighty four. September. I didn't. Digiscan or Rascan didn't come out till um, the very late 80s. Hmm. 
86 is when the Coco 3 came out, so... Yeah, no, the DigiScan didn't come out till around 89. So yeah, were 88 some, or 89, I think, is when I bought mine. So. Were some of the people here just, like, random passerbys? Like, did you generate yes. in interest? Yeah, so that is kind of cool. The guy with the mustache is the Radio Shack uh, manager. Okay. So that's kind of good good promotion for Radio Shack right there, you know? Oh, yeah, they loved it. They had um, a bunch of the Model uh, 1000 set up there. Okay. And... Yeah. Uh, we had a couple of Coco, they had they had a couple of Coco uh, two. Yeah, we did the same thing. We set ours right in front of the Radio Shack store, so if people were interested in the Coco because we also had Ataris and Commodores. We would just send them straight over to the store, so the store manager really liked us too. Nice. This guy here um, was uh, pretty active in our club, Jeff uh, Kranz. His uncle is uh, the the Kranz guy that uh, is Capcom for Apollo Eleven when they landed on the moon. Oh wow! Oh wow! <laughs> it's so '80s. Looking at the hairstyles and the oh, there's an MC10 with a memory unit. <laughs> with nice. You Wait. represented every color computer very well here. This is exciting. The nice. Greater Toledo Color Computer Club. That's a cool sign. Yep. Yep. The Coco Cat has just joined us, Mr. Gizmo Man himself. Hello, Gizmo. That now, is so cool. Uh, the guy that was talking to the guy next to my computer in the beginning, his son is uh, uh, here doing a scanner on this machine, and then my son is uh, next one over. There's another CGP220. And I just noticed, too, on that dot matrix printer, you've got some of those ASCII printouts. That was a pretty popular thing where you could get that done like as, as an iron-on T-shirt, too. They would take your picture at a little kiosk, and then it would get printed out on a dot matrix printer, and it looked kind of like a grayscale photograph, but it was all text. Um, yep. That is such a sign of the time that you got some of those things printed on that printer like that. That's really cool. This is a very nostalgic video. I love this. Yeah. Yeah, it's not very well done, but, you know, that is my son. And then uh, the other guy's son. Uh, there's a um, cool monitor there. Look at that thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's the, the, the video looks like an 80s-style video <laughs> taken off of a VHS tape. So it's actually, you know, very period appropriate. <laughs> the next box you see has the Coco in it. It has a button. Coco Miniature it. Golf. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's an AM deck, I think. Uh, okay. No, yeah, that's a slightly different text looking there. Yep. And uh, see that box with the vents on it and the buttons and stuff? I just talked to that guy. That's the guy that waved to me. He, um, he still has that thing in his basement. <laughs> oh, wow. Look at that thing. That is insane. Three pack cocoa in there. Oh, that's a cocoa in there? It looks like freaking yeah. mission control, man. That's uh, yeah. holy <laughs> crap. Looks like something you'd see on Spinal Tap, where the guy's cranking up his yeah, amps. I think and, oh, the M deck uh, disc drives too. I haven't seen those in years. Yeah. That was kind of a three-inch drive, but it was a hard cartridge. It wasn't like the three and a half that came out a little bit later. Something like something. that. Yeah. There's a Line Printer Seven. Coco Max. Coco, Coco Max. Up. That looks really good. Groucho marks on the screen. Of course, the pop-up menu takes up one third of the screen. <laughs> How, yeah. How's that for resolution? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, a side uh, note: the guy that wrote uh, Cocomax, Tim Jennison, is uh, the guy that started Real Tech that does like the TriCaster and uh, that's digitized stuff, stuff on that screen. And all kinds of stuff. So, so. that's real-time digitizing going on. Yeah. Yes, is that on is. a Coco? Yeah. Yep. But that's the impressive. B or the regular no. one. That's the Rascan or whatever. It's. Um, I don't think so. It couldn't I, be the Rascan because the Rascan didn't come out to the Coco Three. So. So it, well, it's another one. It's not. It's not. Um, wish I could tell you. I, I. If he was here, I could. He could tell you and speak up. Whatever. That's so really impressive. One. It's almost like, he, he almost like pioneered video calling, <laughs> you know? Because. <laughs> yeah. This is where. Uh, where, where my station was back there, um, where those two guys were, um, that's where the Radio Shack guy came with his uh, big uh, cement block phone and hooked it up to CompuServe, and we did uh, OS9, you know, level one, and um, did three windows. We had CompuServe in one window, uh, spreadsheet in one window, and doing directories in another, 
and um, he was like uh, far off future stuff. <laughs> This is really cool. This has a like a nice little grainy news reel f- feel to it as well. I'd love to get a download of this. Are you going to put this on YouTube by any chance? Yeah, I could. Yeah. Never thought of it. That color max is cool. Hours and hours of this. This is just, just perfect. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> hours and hours. I love that yeah. silver cocoa and silver multi pack. That looks so cool. And, and the most data products keyboard in it too, which is yeah. I think my favorite out of all the ones at that time. Wow. For feel. There's a lot of machines here. We have silver cocoa ones, there's some white cocoa twos, there's a TRS eighty model one in there. So uh, this guy here, his name is Ken Parsons. Okay. And uh, he, he still has a collection of stuff down in he lives in the villages in Florida. Okay. Well I'm in Florida too, so maybe we should try to get together. <laughs> And the hair, the 80s hair. I love the 80s hair. I still have mine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that was going to be one of my announcements, too. I was going to say mm-hmm. that. Now, you know, uh, this, guy here, this guy here was looking to buy something, and uh, he was explaining to him how he could, um, you know, how much money he can spend minimally, or, you know, if he has more money, he can spend, he can get uh, another different machine. It was interesting, though, how much the prices were back then. Yeah, 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 yeah. The silver cocoa. I love that machine. I grew up on that machine. <laughs> that is neat. Did you guys ever uh, hear of a mod so that when you push the red button on the uh, top of your Cocoa 1, it would switch to the higher speed? Yeah, like I've heard of that one. Turbo there was a bunch of mods. There was like inverse video, there was a high speed, there was halt the CPU. Yeah. There was a RAM right protect that. switch. If you copied a cartridge, it tried to self-modify itself. It would lock it out so it couldn't overwrite itself. There's yes, a bunch there's of them. A, a button on that one down there. I think it do, did that. The old, like the turbo button that would appear later on PCs that basically just turned off the yeah. cache, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I see the button there right on the top right-hand corner of the keyboard there. Yeah. yeah. Turbo button. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Where we're going, we don't need roads. <laughs> it was a call the Russians button. I call the Russians, huh? <laughs> you, didn't, you needed two people with keys to turn in unison for this thing to kick into high-speed poke mode. <laughs> it's like launching a missile. <laughs> God, the dot matrix printers, the cassette players, all of the technology that we're looking here. Oh, yeah. Any, oh, man. This is and, uh, this is a heaven looking at this stuff. The old Radio Shack TVs, which were um, makes sure you coiled your uh, cable between the TV and the computer, so it wouldn't uh, have a, all that interference. Hmm. Paul Thayer just joined us in chat. Hey, Paul Thayer, welcome to Coco Talk. Uh, we're watching Ron's video that he posted to Facebook right now. Uh, very cool stuff. <laughs> It'll move along here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna we had scrub. a guy in our club that wrote um, music files. His name was Dave Roper, and yeah. uh, he was real talented at writing it. And he would convert all kinds of music. Yeah. Video. Yeah, that's a segment that I want to add to the show. I uh, just uh, didn't have a lot of time leading up to this one, but you know, since we're also going audio now too, I want to start adding more things to become ear candy as well as eye candy. And I thought one cool little segment to add would be to have like the Coco uh, track of the week and play something from Musica or uh, some of those or old Lira, like, or William music, Tells yeah. and yeah, you know, all those things. So you know, once a week we'll feature a uh, Coco music track too. Um, so we're going to have Ron's segment. We're going to have Grant's question of the week. We'll, we'll get into Tech Talk with David Ladd and Curtis Boyle here in a few minutes. Um, we are? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hawaiian shirts. You know what I love about Hawaiian shirts? They Since never they, were never, they were never in style, so they'll never go out of style. So. <laughs> you can tell that's a weird Al fan. <laughs> Uh, the glasses, oh my god, the 80s glasses, those things you could see into the future with them. Uh, <laughs> had I think only... uh, Ron uses them on his telescopes now, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Might have. <laughs> Dot matrix printers. 
It's almost like people at a zoo looking at looking in and everybody, oh my God, what are they doing? What do you feed those computer people? <laughs> okay, is that is that the yeah, end of the tape? Don't poke the computer people. That's about it. There's something a little bit left at the end. I forget what it is. Um, oh, I think I go over there. You can see me skinny. <laughs> where, where are you? Coming. Coming, okay. You can see Ron, young Ron coming up here. Yeah. Okay, Paul Thayer says he has a question for Nick, so we'll get to you in a, in a minute, uh, Paul. There, uh, no, it's not, it's not me. What is it? What is that? Why is that one black and white? I thought this was the color computer club. It is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, maybe I'm not on there. Looks like the end. Okay. Cool stuff. So. That's it. Thanks. This uh, this segment was brought to you by the TRS-80 Color Computer Facebook group, now featuring a very cool piece of artwork, also created by Ron Delvo here. Um, and if you're not uh, if you're not sure how to find the Facebook group, you can find it on my on my Coco Links page, which is amacoconut.com. We're gonna take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be back. And then we have a question for Nick Marentis, and then maybe we'll get into a tech talk if David Ladd's here, so we can talk about the uh, floppy emulation and Mame and all that good stuff. So, Coco Talk will return, people. Hey guys, Original Gamer Stevie Stroh here, and if you're listening to Coco Talk, chances are you're interested in the Color Computer. If you'd like to find out more about the Color Computer, then visit my Coco Links page at imacoconut.com. There you will find communities, podcasts, YouTube channels, project sites, blog sites, hardware, software, buy, sell, trade, you name it. So for all things Color Computer, visit imacoconut.com. That's I-M-A, coconut. Dot com and tell them the original gamer Stevie Stro sent you. Radio Shack Storewide Manager's Red Tag Sale is on now. We've slashed prices 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Save on famous Radio Shack Hi-Fi, car stereo, radios, toys, TV games, calculators, walkie-talkies, and CB radios. Look for the big red tag. Save like never before on these and literally hundreds of red tag specials. Hurry into Radio Shack today. All right, we're back. We're back. Uh, David Ladd, are you still with us? Yeah. We need, we need to get to Simon Jonathan's demo too. Simon, are you push for time? Mm, uh, no, not not as such. Do you have, do you, are you still gonna have time for us to show your demo while you're still on the call? Yeah, what were we talking well, about? Half an hour or something? No, what we'll do is we'll we'll uh, let's let's get Paul's question out to Nick, and then we'll show your demo, and then we'll get into David's uh, tech talk. I don't know if we have a question from Paul. He had to leave. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, gotta go. The wife is calling. I'll catch you guys next time. Have fun. Uh, okay. Uh, Paul's wife's good. Okay, so then what we're gonna do then is I will switch over <laughs> to firing up my color computer three here. If I can manage multitasking here right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my color computer three is live okay so uh, I need to get out of this I need to go to uh, dir one okay I don't remember what I you know what I'm not running drive wire. no I, I have to I have to be running drive wire that's the problem okay uh, it's technology people uh, I have it shared out through DriveWire. I'm not running DriveWire. So <laughs> let me uh, fire up DriveWire real quick. It's technology, not magic. <laughs> DriveWire for UI. Does that mean I need to reboot my Cocoa port to find it, or will it find it as soon as I fire up DriveWire? It'll be fine. Just mount the oh, volume and go at it. Oh, hold on a second, DriveWire too. DriveWire is not magic. Uh, no, never mind. I... Shoot. Okay, this I I'm let's we're just ah, dude, I'm not no, sorry. Can't do it. I I've I'm making so many changes at once right now, I just I can't even do this. So um we'll just uh what's the latest video? We'll pull up your video and um and we'll look at it that way. Um cool. sorry about that. My my I my I was in the middle of, of reconfiguring my drive wire because Ron Klein was showing me how to use my drive wire 
to manage drive wire on the RetroPie or the Cocoa Pie. So my drive wire configurations are all wackadoodle right now, and I just don't have the mental capacity to try to fix them. Um, so let me pull back up the Facebook. Got to know its limitations. Yeah, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to make. I'm. I'm doing so many things at once right now. Steve, yeah. Steve, so, can you just run? Can you just run Explorer or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. I suppose I could do that. You you make Does too it, much sense. Say, you, you make too you, much sense, Simon. Sorry about that. Pardon? I said you're making too much sense now. You're you're you're, you're talking <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, I am crazy. <laughs> so hold you're on. Steve mad. He's he'll be joining you soon. Yes. All right. So hold on. Let me. Let me switch screens. Tell me, guys, if you can see this. Okay. So I've got Mame open, and what I'll do right now is I'm going to load in floppy disk one. I'm going to mount a file. I'm going to go to my desktop, and I'm going to pick the vector disk that Simon just sent us. So let's go ahead and do that. Good. I haven't tried it on Mame. It's probably going to flake out. That's not the right disk. Okay. Don't confuse me with the facts, sir. Oh, it's drive one, I think. Okay, hold on. Media, floppy disk one, floppy disk two. That's the problem is that it's... Okay, so now it's timing out. So it's... What is it? Drive one, right? Dur. Dur. Okay, I've got test, cube, and tetra. Try cube. Can everybody see this okay? Yep. Yep. It's great. If mine breaks it, I'm going to break mine. There we go. Is this a lower resolution? No, same as last week. It's just, um, I don't think that the screen refresh is keeping up with it quite as well, so the, the diagonal lines look a little shaded. It does on a real machine and on, uh, and on uh, VCC and on um, X-Raw. Okay. But it looks freaking beautiful, man. This is... Um, so this is a follow-up to what we looked at last week when you first were showing this and you were just kind of working out the code. Um, yeah. You've made it faster, smoother. It's completely flicker-free, and this is a it's an amazing rotating cube. Yeah, and that's uh, the cube is actually bigger than last week. Okay. So if you take... Um, is there an escape key for this, or do I have to reset the machine? Uh, no, break... Um, re uh, yeah, or soft reset. All right, let me figure out how to do that on mess. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, there. It is. It's under right. options. Soft reset. Set them on down. There we go. Okay. There you go. So if you take the other one, it's called Terra or Tess. Which one, Terra, Tetra, or Tess? Which one you want me to do first? Tess. Tess. Yes, okay. this was kind of the acid test because this is 16 points and 32 lines. Oh, wow. It's a tesseract. It's a yes, cube it within a cube. It's the Asgard stone. Yes. Mind equals blown. Whose mind <laughs> is blown right now, people? It's My the Hellraiser mind. box, isn't it? Yeah, it's called a, it's called a, a Terrasect, a Tesseract, a, a Hypercube, whatever you want to call it. It's very smooth. Smooth and flicker free, and this is incredible three dimensional vector arch just rotating in space. Um, and it's, it's the Coco 2 at 0 0.89 megahertz. Yeah. Quick yeah. question for you, Simon. Are, are you supporting zooming in there yet, or are you just doing rotations at this point? Uh, uh, well, actually, given given I, I changed the code to because last week's code was just using positive numbers for uh, for describing the figure. So I changed the code to use positive and negative numbers. And here for the Tesseract, I'm using uh, plus thirty. The plus 15 for the, the inside one, but if you make the cube smaller, essentially a, a rotation around Origo using sine cosine is plus minus one, so you can actually make it a tiny little dot, and then you can actually add scaling or zoom in to it. So I can, I can zoom it as is, but 
to save to save cycles to save um, space whatever the window itself is 128 by 128 pixels so the largest rotated point you will have would be plus minus 63 on every axis okay you understood any of that curtis <laughs> yeah a little bit uh, uh, like the one uh, from hot cocoa we mentioned last week actually had the zooming yeah. feature but it didn't run as quick yeah maybe that's why because it had extra calculations because it would zoom the whole right through the whole screen in fact you could fly right into the box and see <coughs> you know the sides go past you type thing but it didn't run this fast or smooth from what i remember anyway I haven't had time to f dig it out again so you want me to run the third one simon uh, I, that was just one I mashed up very, very quickly. So you can run it to to, to just show that, okay, um, the amount of points will matter to how fast it's going to rotate. Because what I do here is I give the routine points and, and uh, okay, which, which uh, vertices should we connect? Is that the Tetra? I'm confused on which ones I've run so far. Yeah, that's the one. This one's ah. pretty bad. See, it's only it's only f like four points. It's a pyramid, though. It's a rotating pyramid. Yeah, and it's only got four points, and well, one, two, three, six lines. So, the smaller the object, the faster it's going to run. Right. All right. No, it looks cool though. It looks really cool. Yeah, so some of the people commenting in the uh, YouTube live chat right now. Richard Lorbieski says, still reminds me of the Atari arcade game Space Duel. It's very cool. And Perry Duick says, nice 3D modeling on the Coco. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, I, I This is a very nostalgic look for me, looking at um, the vector style games. Uh, weren't too many on the Coco, right, Curtis? Yeah, it was Rommel 3D, Rommel's Revenge, Space Wreck. Which was yeah. a clone of the Star Trek simulator from the arcade. Um, uh -huh. There's a couple of others, I think. Hypers, one of the Mark Data product ones had a 3D tank game too. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, but yeah, Kieran, not a lot. Kieran's got asteroids somewhere. Okay. Okay. That's just 2D modeling. Dungeons of Dagrath. Dungeons of Dagrath, yeah. D Dungeons of Dagrath is definitely 3D, but not necessarily. Well, I guess it's 2D vectors. The characters are 2D yeah, vectors. It's more here, like fixed vector, I guess, or something. Yeah, it's yeah, but I guess that falls into you that. You can't category. rotate it anywhere in space that you want. You, 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 you know, yeah. straight on look, and then yeah, the but fake but scrolling. It, yeah, pre done it, news. You can look straight ahead or turn left or turn right, and that's all you get. Yeah, okay. it's like Phantom Slayer 2, which does a pseudo 3D. Varlock, but. Perry Perry says Varlock, yeah, that was the chess yeah, game. That one, that one cool. does use full 3D. Yeah. At the end of the day, I've got, I've got um, just because it fits my needs, I've got a 128 by 128 window in the middle of the screen, but I can pan that window anywhere I need to. Okay. Um, Six, Sixty says, "Now you just need perspective, AI, and a trading engine." <laughs> <laughs> yes, because everyone wants elite. Yeah. yeah. Flight Sim yeah. One kind of was this way yeah. too. All right, uh, David Ladder, you must ready for your tech talk. I can be whenever you're ready. Okay, sir. we're going to take another quick commercial announcement. We'll be back after these words with tech talk. From Radio Shack, the TRS-80 Model 3. And at $200 off, it's a great value. Select from Radio Shack's huge program library to aid your children's education, plan your personal and household budgets, or to entertain with fast action games. You can even learn to write programs. The TRS-80 Model 3, on sale for $7.99. Only at Radio Shack and Radio Shack Computer Centers. The computer experts. Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's me. It's Original Gamer Stevie Stro. You know, gameplay goodness. To get your very own gameplay goodness DVDs featuring color computer games played by the original gamer Stevie Stro, visit 8bit256.com and grab yourself a Coco Gaming DVD today. That's 8bit256.com for all of your gameplay goodness needs. And we're back. 
<laughs> Welcome back to Coco Talk. And uh, so we're going to have segments. I like the idea of segments. <laughs> uh, Ron, did you have anything else you wanted to show us? Is your, or is your our demonstration today, we're just going to leave it with the video, because that was pretty damn good, that to be honest that. with you. I didn't bring any stuff in because, well, if I was out in the observatory, I have stuff to show, but my yeah, that's fine. computer overheats and then the screen goes blank. And then I'm like lost. I don't know what to do. I don't. I, I push the buttons. Nothing happens. I push um, power button, and I had that, and it was crazy. Wow. So Rich as it gets cooler, it'll be easier to go out there and do that. Otherwise, next week I'll bring in some stuff and have. Uh, okay. And I'll have your I'll have your artwork queued up, and then you let me know what type of music we can use, to introduce you, and all that kind of good stuff. Oh, to, Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Richard Lorbieski, who does have an, uh, a history working with, with Tandy support and everything else, too, he says, here's some trivia. It costs $73 to manufacture the uh, Model 3 4K Level 1 Basic, and it's sold for six ninety nine dollars retail. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Neil Brookin says that the world of flight took up hundreds of my childhood hours. That's another, I guess, vector one, huh? Three, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Atomic so software. That, yeah, Richard said, I worked in the factory that made the Model 3. That is pretty pretty cool. Um, Perry Duke is saying, I love your sponsor ads, especially Radio Shack. Richard, what sort of things did you do there during that time? So maybe Richard could answer that in the next few minutes. All right, so it is time. Since I don't have an official uh, lead-in in infographic or, or, or theme song yet, I'm going to wing this one. But ladies and gentlemen, it is time for Tech Talk with David Ladd and possibly even Curtis Boyle. Take it away, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you brought up something earlier. What was it that you wanted to discuss? Uh, uh, Barry Nelson was talking about how he has MAME now um, compiled for the Mac, and he included the uh, floppy disk controller patch that he backported to an older version of MAME. Richard Cavell mentioned we should make a disclaimer that if you're running an older version of MAME that there is that problem with the floppy drive and that you can possibly run into corruption. So I thought that was a great segue for you to talk about again a little bit about the problem with the um, the, the floppy controller emulation in MAME and, and what's going on right now to maybe address that. Um, well, as far as MAME itself goes, um, I haven't had time to talk to any of the devs to find out if there might be a underlying issue with the floppy disk controller, because technically William Assel knows that part better. Um, but for the drive motor select issue where they were turning off the motors for all the drives except for the one that was being accessed, um, Kieran came up with his own version of the patch. Um, Barry came up with one that was very similar. Um, and then, of course, the devs um, came up with one that did the same thing. So if you're running the what will be the current one at the end of this month, that issue should be patched. Okay. So um, now, of course, uh, Ron Klein with the Coco 3 or the Coco Pi 3 project, he should already be running the current build of MAME with that patch, plus my modification to add a Coco 2 oh. with, that has the 6309 CPU enabled version of that. Um, so, but as far as right now, the um, option for having multiple drives being accessed back and forth and having it work is for my tests I ran it for 24 hours accessing three floppy drives back and forth and Nitrous 9 didn't blow up for a full 24 hours so I can pretty much say it's working at the moment <laughs> That's I think that's great. longer than Nick's ever had Nitrous 9 running in, in one row <laughs> I think that was five seconds wasn't it <laughs> yeah. that's so. something so prior to this patch, if you were running multiple floppy drives, you ran the um, risk of contaminating or corrupting your disk images. Just yes. Yeah. Um, most people, if if you were you just doing simple things, you know, you'd ask access one drive, the drives would shut off. Then you'd access the other drive. No problem. It just seemed to be when 
it was the system expected the drives to be on, it switched, and it didn't work. Which is why William thinks there's a sub issue with the base floppy controller mechanism because on a real Coco, if the floppy drive is off and it tries to read it, the controller will return an error that it couldn't read anything from the floppy drive, which is what the behavior should be. But for some reason with MAME, if the drive is being accessed and it's and not it's on, it just it returned the data that it was last read, which is, is not, not standard behavior. So... so. Okay. It's well, we've got it fixed, and the latest version will be what one eight nine or something like that. Should be if they go with their current numbering scheme. Um, the other um, thing, I wouldn't really call it an issue. It's just uh, a minor compatibility okay. thing because okay. on the Coco, um, we've discussed this before, where you can actually do up to twenty sectors per track, um, and the uh, MAME uses what's called a JVC header um, for disk images that do not store what they call the MFM data. So, but J the JVC, you can set in the header, this disk image has 20 sectors per track, and right now, um, MAME blows up trying to read the disk image. Because what it assumes as a standard value doesn't work for these 20 sector per track disk images. So, so it's not actually reading the header then, it's just hard coded to say 18 sectors per track. Right, and if you remove that restraint then you get another error uh, because they're using the pure Western Digital 1770X header information for building the track data which unfortunately with the 20 sectors per track you have to throw that out the window cuz that just that doesn't fly so it's it's something that's going to have to be a a slight modification to how they're handling their their floppy disk images being stored in ram so but on that um I haven't run it blown anything else up with me. <laughs> <laughs> You're not it's trying been, hard enough. It's been a week since you've broken anything, David. <laughs> well, technically, if you want to talk about breaking things, I could discuss the Toolshed project and the OS9 utility, but... <laughs> well, then go ahead. But well, this, is, this is the tech corner here. This is the tech talk, so please do. Um, so, there's been some things, because like with the... Um, issues with the uh, Coco SDC and um, I shouldn't say issues but where you want to build Nitrous 9 disk images that are larger um, because the fact that uh, you need very specific sector offsets to put your boot track to work correctly um, that was kind of iffy because the fact that the OS 9 and the sub option gen assumed two sector offsets for either single or double-sided floppy disk images which isn't how real OS 9 works it asks the disk with logical sector number zero how many sectors per track are we supposed to have okay this is what we got now we need to do the the math of 34 times sectors per track times heads and we get our sector offset and that's what we're supposed to be but it wasn't doing that. It says, we're going to assume, get this, assume it's always 18 sectors per track, which you can't do because assumption is um, a bad thing in computers. So, yeah. So there's a fix. It's been submitted to Tormod. So as soon as that's been approved, that should be fixed. And then, of course, found another issue with the format routine for creating disk images that it gets a uh, what is it floating point error trying to calculate uh, trying to create a four gigabyte disk image <laughs> so 
Yeah, that's the maximum that OS 9, Nitrous 9 can support natively is, is 4 gig if you're using multi-sector clusters. Yeah. Um, which, if I remember right, was 32 sectors per cluster, I believe, is what yeah, OS 9... Yeah, I think 9... so. You can actually make a higher one, but it doesn't do you any good because you're only allowed so many sectors, just the way the drive uh, geometries calculate. You get 24 bits that you can calculate your sector number to go to, so yeah. that you max out at 4 gig. Yes, and also on top of that, if you set your cluster size larger, then if you have a lot of small files, then you're just wasting space, space in yeah. your volume anyway. So it's just minor things, Steve, that, you know, just minor things that need to be fixed to for future versions. So. And to be honest, I mean, creating a, a file system back in 1980 for an 8-bit micro that could handle 4 gig was pretty forward-looking. I don't know yeah, anybody else would have done it. I mean, DOS was limited back in the fat 16 days to what 32 meg or something is the maximum oh. they could use. So, um, I think with fat 16, I thought it was was it not two gigabyte partitions? Well, when fat first started, it was fat 12, and it was actually oh, fat 12. 30, yeah, sorry, yeah, fat meant, 12 yeah. had a 32 megabyte. I remember having to yeah, partition in hard drives. Yeah, I should yeah. have said fat 12. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so again, you were saying this 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 last thing you were just speaking about. This is the tool shed project. Yes, there's the the tool shed project has many utilities. There's one for taking, uh, creating WAV files, so that way you can put your binary programs into a WAV file, so you can play it and do it through the cassette port on a Coco. You got uh, tools for disk extended color basic for reading and writing and formatting uh, disk images there. Um, then you got the OS 9 utility for uh, formatting, reading, and writing disk images. Um, and a lot of those tools are what's used in the Nitrous 9 project as well for creating the disk images that most of us download for the uh, Coco SDC, the regular floppy, um, you know, the... Coco 3 FPGA project, you know, all those disk images that get pre built, the OS 9 utility from the Toolshed project is what's used to make them. So, who is, um, who is producing the Toolshed project? Uh, there are several people that's on the uh, uh, repo. I can bring that up really quick to. Uh, but th this, is not, to uh, this is not William Astle's project, right? No, this is something that was before Lost Wizard Tools. Okay, so the tool shed is something that you can use. Wasn't that Boise you... and somebody? I'm trying to remember. Um, I'm pretty sure Boise is one of the people because he's the one that had to add me to the project. Um, so the three people that are, uh, it says on here, brought to you by Boise, Tim Linder, and Tormod are the three okay. people that's listed on the Toolshed project. Okay. And what is the primary role or purpose of Toolshed? Is it mostly for Nitrous 9 stuff or is it used for other? No, you it's mentioned there's a lot of things you can do with this. There's cross development applications here. Right. It's It's got the tools for Disk Basic, for copying the making the disk images, copying the files to or from the disk images, which you know, it that's why it's called the Toolshed Project because there's multiple ones. Okay. There's the color extended basic for working with the cassette stuff. Um, so you got pretty much all three scenario of tools to work with, all in the one package. So that's cool. But, so it's it's just a you know there's a few things that you know back in the day most of us weren't doing four gig partitions with the tools so it's like you know if no one's testing for that large how could you find a problem so of course me going out of the box <laughs> so so if there's a problem yo you'll find it <laughs> and in doing so I'll probably make someone upset at some point or another <laughs> well they shouldn't get upset they should just fix the crap <laughs> if you're gonna get upset get upset at yourself <laughs> you know like, like, like I said it's you know sometimes you develop for what is needed now and other times you don't think about what might be needed 
in the future, which obviously the microware team um, was thinking far ahead, because, you know, making your logical sector number zero be able to handle all the way up to a four gig volume back in the 80s? Who would ever yeah. think of a drive on a computer back then that would be four gig? You know? Right. So yeah, 1980 itself, yeah. So That's personally, I'm, I'm impressed with the microware team for that forward thinking. So very cool, very cool. You got anything else technical you can add to the uh, tech talk segment here, Mr. Curtis Boyle? Uh, no, I mean it's um, basically he's trying to fix the tools there because there's you know a couple little bugs with some you know long range cases like trying to make the maximum dry size drive image you can make and and it doesn't quite work properly. Um, and then the boot track thing he was mentioning too, because there's some hard coding in it that shouldn't have been there. It should be reading sector zero just to figure out exactly what drive geometry do you have, and now I'll calculate where to go to find the boot track. Um, it would have been even better if we had something like a BIOS or something where you could actually just change the value in the BIOS and you could pick wherever you want your boot track to be, which uh, you know PCs did later on. But uh, mm -hmm. you know that, this, that's not forward thinking enough back in the Tandy Microsoft Disk Extended Basic in 1982 days. Roger that. Um, so I noticed that a number of you um, got uh, Coco Talk shirts. Does anybody have one of those shirts that you can show us if you want to switch your cam on? And I'll give you a minute to to do that if you do, because I was going to run another commercial. But I'll just show you real quick because oh, we have Mark Overholzer's already got his on. All right, Mark, wearing his Coco Talk shirt, looking good there. Um, so shameless plug time, but so yeah, we reached a milestone last week, right? So last week we reached 20 episodes, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, Rick Adams' son, Joel Adams, or excuse me, Instagram artist Joel M. Adams, who's done all the artwork for our retro swag shop so far. He created this Coco Talk shirt now, which is the logo for our show and his logo for our podcast. And the T-shirt was available. Uh, uh, last week to celebrate our 20th episode. And a number of the Coco Talkers went ahead and got one. And here we see the lovely and talented Mark Overholzer wearing his Coco Talk shirt. And it looks very dapper on you, sir. I like that quite a bit. In and black. We, in black, yes. So we ended up selling uh, how many shirts last weekend? One, two, three, four, five, six shirts were sold last weekend um, by just promoting the fact that we have a Coco Talk shirt. So we got one, two, three, four Coco Talk shirts were sold, one Coco 3, and one colorful Coco 3. So we have the, we have the two different Coco 3s. We've got one that's got just the computer, and we've got one that's got the character. So we sold four Coco Talk shirts and two Coco shirts, and... Uh, and then that just looks really cool. It looks really good. Um, and I, b when when this artwork was sent to me, and we went ahead and did the um, did the T-shirt and got the T-shirt ready to be able to promote during the show, uh, I had not even conceived the fact that we would be doing the podcast yet. And in the process of setting up the website for the podcast and wanting to create some catchy eye work, I have made. Coco Talk look a little bit better by putting it against a backdrop and making it look like it's on a TV and things like that. So I am going to, um, in the near future, also upload a, a, a deluxe version of the Coco Talk shirt that's going to show the guy inside the TV screen. And I'll have little logos that it's on YouTube and iTunes and Google Play and have the website. So um, I, 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 it's something I want to do because I think it looks cool. And I realize some of you have already spent your hard-earned money. You might be pissed off at me right now. <laughs> but we'll have the deluxe version. And when the time permits and when the finances allow, I will purchase just one for all of you as a gift maybe by a tandy assembly time <laughs> so, so um but now the shirt looks really good and so yeah if you guys want to um support what we're doing here um then go ahead and do that yeah so rick adams also has a coco talk promo which i have not had time to queue up but what i will go ahead and just play it because um i've been spent so much time getting things ready for Putting old episodes on the podcast, I ran late getting uh, our actual live show um, prepared for today. So give me two seconds. While I'm looking for that, let me go ahead and run a commercial, and we'll look for that. Let the Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home. Instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade. And there's more. 
The color computer is an educational aid, a home management tool, an up-to-the-minute electronic information service. The programmable, expandable TRS-80 color computer from $399 only at Radio Shack, the biggest name in little computers. Where can you turn to find the latest news and information about the Tandy Color Computer? Only one place, the Coco Crew Podcast. Join Neil Blanchard and John Linville each month as they scan the internet and social media for the latest stories about the Tandy Color Computer, Compatibles, and other 6809-based computers. It's the Coco Crew Podcast. Visit www.cococrew.org and begin listening today. All right, so we're going to have to do this manually, but yeah, Rick Adams created a really cool little bumper piece here that I have not had a chance to queue up in my broadcast software, so I'll just show it to you off my desktop. So here we go. Take it away, Rick. Hey, have you got your Coco 3 yet? Hi, this is Rick Adams, author of Temple of Rom and Shanghai, and you've tuned into Coco Talk, the nation's leading live talk show featuring the Tandy Color Computer. What'd you think of that? Excellent. Did you, look good. Could you guys hear that? Yep. yep. Yeah, I went ahead and put I put the video to the audio, but yeah, <laughs> and so uh, Bill Noble created one for us too. So your your partner in crime there, Curtis. Let's let's take a look at Bill's bumper here too. Hey everybody, this is Bill Noble, co-author of Nitrous Nine. You are listening to Coco Talk Live, the leading live Coco Talk show. Oh yeah, what do you think of that? <laughs> this is I think the people are trying to shame me to make one here quick. The uh, nation's leading live Coco Talk show because we're the only live Coco Talk show. <laughs> so that's got nothing to do with it. We're still the nation's leading. <laughs> I, I think you have to actually change it to the world leading, actually, because there's a lot of international viewers. That is true. Well, the nation, yeah, every every country, universe. Well, and we didn't we didn't mention which nation. So every country has a nation, right? The yeah. nations. So it's leading in every one of them. We didn't say America's most watched talk show. The leading <laughs> Antarctic. Coco the leading, talk yes. <laughs> So, yeah, it's very cool. So um, let me do this, too. So for those of you who are not familiar with the fact that we are now a podcast, because most of you who watch us watch us on YouTube, I will show you the website here real quick. And, you know, I'm not a web master by mm -hmm. any means, but I think the Coco Talk Live website looks halfway decent, you know. On the home page, we have the little intro clip that I created here. And by the way, I created the audio for this in GarageBand, and I did that inspired by that interview I had with Mike Rowans. You know, Mike Rowans creates so much great content for the Coco Crew podcast. Um, the great thing about this community is I think we inspire one another, you know. And so um, the Coco Crew inspired me to, you know, want to come to Coco Fest. And the Coco Crew is, you know, a great source of content every month for us to talk about and listening to the coco crew and wanting to hear more coco wanting to have more cowbell was one of the catalysts too for coco talk you know we don't want to wait another 30 days to have to hear this we want to hear it every week damn it <laughs> so coco talk is kind of the filler between the coco crew podcast but they inspire us you know um so mike rowan's stuff is very inspirational i'm going to try to raise the bar and create you know kind of cool commercials like he does and things like that so here's our home page right so it's coco talk live this is where i've also taken all of the old episodes that you can also get on youtube but if you click on the link for video episodes, I've got them here kind of in a gallery format. And this is where you can just pick an episode that you want to play. And you can play it right here in your browser. So we got that going on. Uh, if you want to see the different podcasts, this takes you to the podcasting website that I'm hosted with right now, which is called Podbean. And these are all our various episodes here. So we have episode one. We got episode two, episode three. That link is also on our Coco Talk Live webpage. I do have a um, I do have a page down here that's called Connect. 
So if you want to connect with us, this is where we'd love the people who are watching the show and listening to the show. We want to hear feedback from you. So like, do you have an idea for the show? Would you like to be a guest on the show? Would you like to submit an audio or video segment? That, you, that we can play on the show in the future. What about feedback? Would you like to record an audio clip or a video clip, or you just want to send us text telling us what you think about the show? And bumpers, I really want to get some bumpers. We got two bumpers right now. Actually, there's a third I'm gonna show you too. We have a special guest bumper too. But yeah, so I'd love to get some bumpers. So if you watch the show, just record a little thing that says, hey, this is whoever the hell you are, and you are watching Coco Talk or whatever, you know, stuff, stuff like that. We would love to get that. How can you send that to me? Well, you can send an email to Coco Talk at cocotalk.live. So uh, I also want to recognize who are the partners, who are, who, are, who are our partners in crime, who are our sources of inspiration. Well, on here, we've got links to the Coco Crew podcast. We've got links to Floppy Days. We've got links to the TRS-80 Trash Talk podcast. I've got links to the Glenside Color Computer Club, which is where Coco Fest comes from. And I've got links to Tandy Assembly. So the things that we talk about on this show are all compiled for your convenience on Coco Talk dot live so um that website is kind of accompanying the um the fact that we are now a multimedia uh show besides video and audio so i'm trying to pull it all together for you in a very um kind of convenient way to consume all the various formats that we have all right so it's been it's been an interesting ride uh, what do we have here in the chat right now? Mark says, I have heard around the interwebs that the current owners of OS 9 may have other issues of OS 9 with stuff. What are you talking about there, Mark? Oh, um, there was something about uh, copyright stuff or enforcing copyright, or was that just uh, somebody talking about something off, off the wall? <laughs> there was something I saw somewhere. I don't remember where it was, but... Mm. I remember Not, there was some. There was a complaint about some trademark stuff about the yeah. symbols yeah. or something, but I yeah. haven't heard anything past that. Okay. Now, when you say OS nine, are you talking about Microware's OS nine or the Mac OS nine? Microware. Microware. Because that was another thing too. Is that OS nine was the last version of the Mac OS before they switched to OS X, which became yeah. Linux. And there based. was a legal lawsuit between Microware and Apple, and Microware lost. Ah, uh, well, they don't have the money. <laughs> so well, they did back then. They just, they just just lost the court case. They said this is two totally different. One's a real time operating system for controllers, and the other one's like a GUI thing. So they said these won't be confused with each other. Right. Usually they preface it with Mac OS nine, so it's like yeah, not you're going to get confused. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah, I'm really excited about the fact that we will hopefully maybe reach. A new audience, uh, people who might not have thought to look for a show like this on YouTube, might be looking for a show like this on some form of podcast. And uh, I am kind of green to podcasting. The only podcast I listen to is the Coco Crew podcast because it's about the Coco. Because honestly, I don't care about too many other things, right? So um, I have subscribed to them. I get a little thing. I get an email when their podcast hits. I get a little thing on my phone saying it's downloaded and it's ready to play. And that's how I consume the Coco Crew. So we're hoping that some other people who like to listen to technology talk shows might find us. And so we might get some listeners out of this. And we're hoping that some of those listeners might become viewers because I feel the best part of this show is the fact that it's live and interactive so we can address the people who are chatting with us and we can dynamically speak about, you know, our topics will will flow. Um, there's there's a nice appeal to that real time this. And then, of course, there's the video replay as well. So there's lots of ways to consume the show. And I would also suspect that there are people who say, I would love to watch it, but I don't have the time or I don't have the bandwidth or, you know, I do a lot of commuting. And if I could just listen while I'm in the car, maybe um, I could listen to it that way. So maybe we're going to um, you know, appease uh, random strangers as well as some loyal listeners who just need a different way to catch the show. So I'm hoping that, you know, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, 21 weeks ago, I never would have imagined we'd still be doing this every week for 21 weeks. I would never imagine that the shows are growing to three hours in length. I never would have imagined that we're getting 200 views on these shows. So despite the fact that it's a bunch of us old guys here talking, there's uh, there's an audience for this. So I'm really flattered and honored and proud to be a part of the fact that we're here talking about cool stuff that we enjoy, you know? 
Yep. And I mean, you, I'm, I'd like to see uh, like some of your stats there. Like we had people on Apple TVs watching or listening to the the podcast, so they probably just you know turn on the TV and they go wander around and do their chores. And then being on TuneIn Radio, I mean, you're right beside radio stations and stuff. There's a podcast section under TuneIn Radio, and now you can pick it up on there too, which I've actually tried on my phone. It works fine. So yeah, a lot of people who do commutes and stuff or have you know subway train rides and that kind of stuff. Here, you're kind of sitting there with nothing to do. You can actually sit there and, and listen to the show. All right. Right now we're up to 153 uh, listens, if you will. I'll, I'll switch this over. And that's interesting that you brought that up. It's, it's interesting to see the demographics of this. I'll switch that screen over right now. So, yeah, we've technically only been on the air in a podcast form for only, you know, a handful of days. So haven't done a ton to promote it yet, but we've gotten 153 downloads, 78% in the United States, 13% in Canada, 7% in Ireland, 1% in Australia, 1% in the United Kingdom. So, yeah, we do have a global audience. How are people consuming this? Apple Core Media, 14%, 20% on Chrome, 10% on iTunes, 7% on uh, Windows Media Player, 6% is on Pocket Cast, whatever the heck that is. And then what are the platforms? Well, 20% is on the iOS. So that's the biggest chunk of listeners are um, Apple device owners. And then we have Mac OS X. So Mac Mac users are 19%, Windows 10, 11%, cross-platform. I don't know what they call cross-platform. Is that Linux? Web browser uh, or, or a podcast maybe? app. A cross-platform podcast app is 9%. And then we've got 7% of unknowns. So the great unknown out there. So, yeah, for only being on, a, uh, on the air for less than a week, the fact that we've got, you know, 100 and change listens to go along with our kind of 200 weekly views that's encouraging that uh, hopefully we're bringing something to the audience and what that has um, inspired me to do is come up with more content and more segments to bring commercials and breaks and more things so when you're listening it's not just the same voices you know I want to try to break it up with some sound breaks kind of like what Mike Rowan does with the Coco crew and stuff so good good stuff uh, some of us have been very quiet. Nick Morentis, we haven't heard from you at all. Yeah, I'm here. No, nothing to report. <laughs> As you were. Uh, Rick, Rick Adams, anything you'd like to share with us? Any new developments? Anything else? He's even quieter. <laughs> yes, he is. I wonder if he's muted. <laughs> Richard Lorbieski says that Nick's been too busy playing with OS 9 so <laughs> that's why he's been quiet <laughs> on the show <laughs> <laughs> yeah what about you Bill Noble how's things going with you oh pretty good I'm actually just uh, enjoying the backyard right now <laughs> yeah yeah I noticed on the uh, Roger Taylor Coco on a chip uh, group that there's a latest uh, firmware update for the cyclone yeah, he's actually got the SG24 modes actually working perfectly now. So That's pretty all... cool. I got a question. Yeah. Yes. Hey, uh, how many, um, which um, program packs are hard to find? Do we have a list of that? or I have a whole bunch of them. I don't know if I have everything, but is there a comprehensive list of all of them and, and ones that are difficult to acquire or whatever. I had or, seen a list a while ago, not not as which ones are the rarest or not, but just a general list of which ones were out there. Yeah. Um, I can't remember where I saw that, though. And I don't know if it was a Tandy only one or if it covered some of the third-party ones, too. Right. Hey, i gotta, I got to let my dog out. I'm going to mute my mic. You guys keep the conversation going. We'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> but what I would say is this. There, the two leading experts in, in ROM pack collections are probably John Linville and Neil Tran. So you can look for either of them in the Facebook group and just post a message there. You'll probably get some 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 sure. uh, responses there. And I'll be back in a second when I'm done walking the dog. So you guys keep the, keep the show going for me. <laughs> so Ron, now uh, did you are, is your collection in just the Tandy ones, or do you have some of the third party ones as well? No, I have a uh, two Timex Sinclairs, and I think I have an uh, extra RAM pack for it and three software um, tapes. <laughs> That's about it. I most of all of my stuff. It's all uh, Tandy stuff. I have two Model Fours, a Model Three, 
various Coco Chews, two Coco Ones, three or four um, Coco Threes. I have one that doesn't work. Uh, it has a 512K upgrade. When you turn it on, it's just a blank screen. I don't know what's going on with that. I'm not uh, too electronic um, aware. I know enough to pull. To I made sure that the um, two uh, capacitors were cut and the memory was gone, but it, it, I still get just a white screen. So yeah, you can try reseating the gimme. Sometimes it works its way a little bit loose and doesn't make good contact. I, did that. I took that it out and put it back in, and it didn't change. Everything else is soldered in, so I don't know. Yeah. I mean, you could try reverting, if you have the chips handy, you could try reverting back to 128K to see if there's anything wrong with the 512K upgrade. But Can you do that without, with those capacitors cut? Yeah, it still works. Oh, okay. I wondered about that. I was nervous about doing that. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you have the later Coco 2s, have you done the uh, 64K upgrades? And those, those actually use the, the two-chip Coco 2s. Use two forty four sixty four chips, and those are the exact same chips. You need four of them for the Coco three original one twenty eight. So you can actually just move them right over and see. Okay, yeah, I'll have to be messing with that and see if I can get it going. And after I, that, talk to the hardware gurus who actually know about this stuff more than I do, and they can help you with anything else. <laughs> I, I have two. Um, I have the peripherals one and another one. Um, uh, you know, I tried two different um, thingies. You the know, the five token upgrade boards, memory boards, yeah, and it didn't change anything. Uh, so, it might be something else then. My All mom right, I'm back. Wife just came back, so I'm gonna mute for a while. So go ahead and talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Did I don't know if Rick heard? Rick, are you on mic? Rick is still not on mic. Okay. <laughs> Rick, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? You're coming in loud and clear now. All right. Sort of. I <laughs> uh, just didn't know if you had anything you wanted to update us on as far as what you're working on lately. Oh, just get ready for the show. That's about it. <laughs> you're officially going to be at Tandy Assembly, and you're. Oh, we looked at the website. We didn't see you listed there yet as an exhibitor or a speaker. That's because you. Um, you went to the page that I was on and said, oh, there's nothing new here, and then you went on. Oh, I did? Let's go back. I apologize. <laughs> you deserve better than that. How did I miss that? <laughs> well, I'm not on the speaker's page yet, although I'm, I'm theoretically speaking. Okay. Uh, but I am on the exhibitor's page. On the exhibitor's the page. Hold on one second. Yeah. Let's find you. Okay, it's Coco no VJ just, Retro. Okay, I missed. My name and I missed a bunch of stuff here. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, let's go back to Tandy Assembly and let's look at our exhibitors. So we have myself. We've got Mike Rowan. We've got Richard Lorbieski, Peter and Alex Satinsky. We've got Cloud Nine Technologies. We got Peter Bartlett, Malcolm Ramey, Randy Kindig, Retro Innovations, Jim Brain, Ian Maverick from Melbourne, Australia is going to be here. Brendan Donahue will be here. Uh, Alan Hightower is going to be showing Tandy 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5,000 PC compatibles. John Linville will be here. Evan Wright showing off uh, his cross-platform text, text adventure uh, development kit. That was very cool. Scott Adams uh, of Adventure International. Michael Brandt, Mike's Miscellany. And then Rick Adams from Burnsville, Minnesota with Bomb Threat the Game. There we go. You were hiding down Eat there in the, the corner. How dare they tuck you away in the uh, basement of the page here? <laughs> yeah, I should do it alphabetical well, by order, last name, right? The order in which you registered. The order in which you registered. Okay, there you go. So Very I was cool. late to the party. So that's what I get. Better late than never, right? As long as you're at the party. Very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. So um, will Bomb Threat be available to purchase at Tandy Assembly in, the to in October? I hope so. Okay. Uh, I haven't heard back from John Linville yet. Okay. Well, uh, that will be exciting. And the crew are supposedly going to make it happen for me. Okay. So I hope so. That will be exciting. Another brand new color computer game to purchase. And since you mentioned John Linville, that means it will hopefully be on a cartridge? Yes. There That's you the go. Anyway. 
That's the plan. Because that should be the Rick Adams tradition. Your first two games are on cartridge. Your third game should be on a cartridge. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's cool. That would be exciting. Very, very cool. So I'm making a big list of things to take to the show, and it's getting longer and longer and longer. And uh, But I'm driving down, so I'll be loading up my car and all full of stuff. And bring, bring it down. So that'll be really nice now that I have a second car because, you know, I don't have to entrust all of this delicate electronic equipment to the airlines. Right, right, and right. The cargo hold and having it get smashed into little tiny pieces. So that'll be good. Well, and by the time you actually go there, you'll be renting a U-Haul, right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> all the stuff you, all the stuff you buy in an auction or all, all the money you have to uh, you know you get from your sales you need a, a, just, a yeah just rent a flathead semi on the way back so you can home back over there uh, armored, you're gonna be buying uh, and, when I was uh, visiting my mom in Oregon uh, uh, she had just been told by her doctor that she can't drive anymore and she's 88 years old and she was pretty mad about that but uh, she said you know oh, so I'm gonna give that car to you so we flew out there and then we took the car back, and it's got like an old uh, full-size car, so it'll have plenty of room for all my stuff, So and it rides really comfortably, so it should be fun. And the road trip. Yeah. Road trips are good. James Ross is leaving us, but James Ross in the YouTube live chat says, Good talk, folks. Got to go. We'll join in one of these Saturdays down the road before Christmas. Okay. All I want for Christmas is James Ross to join us. So, yeah, that would be good. Um, <laughs> cool stuff. So uh, what else do we need to talk about this week? Have we beat this one to death? We don't, do we got a few more things to cover? Um, I know we've, we've kind of bounced all over the place, but I think we had a good representation of uh, Ron's segment and some tech talk, and we've had our newbie question. We, we went over Facebook. What else have we not covered this week? The only other thing I would have mentioned was doing a demo of Syrian's final version of Dungeons, but I don't think you've had time to, to get that downloaded um, and set up. Uh, I, well, I have a version. I don't know if it's the final version, but yeah, I would like to show that. Uh, is Karen still with us in the call? No. It doesn't appear Karen's to be. Karen's off. Oh, okay. um, we'll hold it off next week then. Yeah, we have, well, not only that, but he had, he had left a comment. I don't know if it was, uh, if, if it was a group comment or not, but he mentioned something about the game plays best when you have more than one person to play it because it's designed to you know four players simultaneously split screen scrolling um so i want to see what i can do to maybe get it fired up on the cocoa pie i'll put it out there in the living room hook up a cordless keyboard and maybe get me and a couple of my kids on there one with a joystick a couple on the keyboard maybe put two joysticks and i'll handle the keyboard and it'd be interesting to see if we can get three people playing uh, dungeons at the same time you know or something. So I'll I'll try to figure out some creative way to show off uh, multi multiplayer on it. Yeah, you could even do a comparison video type thing where you can show like Gauntlet, Gauntlet Two, and Dungeons because they're all kind of the same thing and they all allow three or four players. So yeah, yeah. Do a compare yeah. and see how they how they play. Yeah, that's definitely. Uh, I smell a showcase coming. So. <laughs> uh, go ahead, David. No, I was also going to say something earlier, which I should have said after I was done uh, stating with the, you know, the minor things with the different things like MAME and the Toolshed project. I do want to clarify, I'm not bashing anybody that's working on those projects. (laughs) I just want to clarify that. I'm just just mentioning that, you know, I found these issues. It just needs Mm -hmm. to be fixed. You people have done a great job at you know, making great tools and everything. So I just wanted to clarify, I'm not bashing anybody or putting anything down. I just, just wanted to make sure it was clarified. Yeah, Ladies we don't put gen- David down, so yeah. that's, that's not a concern. We don't do anything. So. That, politically di- <laughs> uh, that politically correct disclaimer was brought to us by David Ladd, folks. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that's true. Uh, you you, you want to say that. you you Obviously, you don't intend that, and hopefully people don't take it that way. But if it's, if it's a project with only three people working on it, uh, chances are one of those three people might feel like you just urinated in their chariots. So who knows? Um <laughs> But it's, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's like, okay, well, here's an here's a issue I discovered. I'd like to report the issue to you. And you actually came up with a fix for it too, right? Um, the one issue I did, the other one I just recently noticed the other night, but I've been 
busy with my own real life issues that keep happening. So it's I've been busy doing other stuff. So gotcha, gotcha. Neil Brookins back in the chat says my battery died even though I was plugged in. That's not supposed to happen. That's true. And it's not supposed to happen. I'm glad we've we've cleared up that there is a real Neil Brookins, not to be confused with the uh, fictional character. All right. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and run another uh, commercial here real quick, and then we may or may not wrap this up, depending on what you guys say after these messages. So we'll be right back, folks. We'll be back in two and two. Christmas is about family. <laughs> and so is this computer, the Tandy 2500 RSX from Radio Shack. For the incredible price of $799.95, you get a 386SX 25 megahertz processor with 24 built-in programs for budgeting, word processing, and home education. With the power to run PC-compatible software, made in America by American families. Christmas, families, and a Tandy 2500 RSX, they go together. From Radio Shack, your Christmas electronics store. Something new is coming. Tandy Assembly. Tandy Assembly is about Radio Shack and Tandy Computers. Tandy Assembly is about interacting. Tandy Assembly is about people. Tandy Assembly is about fun. The first gathering of its kind. Computers of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. All Radio Shack and Tandy makes and models. Join, Join us. us. Don't miss Tandy Assembly. In Chillicothe, Ohio. October 7th and 8th. Whether you're near or far. Tandy Assembly is for everyone. Visit our webpage at www.tandyassembly.com. Tandy Assembly. All right, well, Tandy Assembly just got their second, third, or fourth plug. Uh, <laughs> Norlander says, please restrict your ads to the Coco. Yes, because I'm showing some Tandy uh, 2500 SX 386 machines too. Yeah, well, you know, Tandy has a large line of products. And since we're getting ready for Tandy Assembly that celebrates all Radio Shack platforms, I thought it was, it was, good. It was good to share the love with our cousins as well and our big brothers and uncles and our drunk uncles and all that good stuff. And um, we did share some hardware, like some of the old joysticks and stuff were yeah. both Cocos and Tandy 1000s, so there's a bit of a crossover there. A little bit of a <laughs> crossover there, definitely. So, have we beat episode 21 to death, or does anybody got anything else they want to throw out there before we wrap this up? Uh, we'll have we'll have a, um, a uh, nice little uh, graphic from my spot and have a name for it, and uh, I'll have a stack of stuff to show you next okay. week. Okay. Yeah, tell me what what's what soundtrack, what song to bring you into as well. I have that. Uh, we'll find some generic something or something. <laughs> I probably can't do Fogarty like I want. <laughs> yeah, if it's a small enough clip, I can do it. An under thirty second clip, I can do. So. All right, cool. Um, I, I have cool. Uh, something my son did, so maybe that'll work. Okay, that'll cool. Keep it all in the family. Yeah, it's so. called Panic on Funkotron. <laughs> neat, 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 neat. Well, I'm going to take a quick minute here to go back and, and recognize the people who were in the a live chat with us on YouTube Live as well. So Big West Purdue was here. Richard Cavell. Uh, Davey Mitchell was here. Uh, did I mention Big West Purdue? I think I did. Neil Brookins was here in the live chat. Chappers1225 said hello, hello. Um, Perry Duke was here. Hello, Perry. And who else was here? Uh, Boyce and Tech, that's Richard Lorbieski. Bill Noble stopped by. James Ross was here. Um, Sixie was here, that's Karen. Norlander was here. Hey, Norlander. And am I missing anybody else? Mark Overholzer also in the chat talking to people as well as being on the call. Richard Lorbieski. Paul Thayer, hey, everybody. He had a quick question for Nick, but then he had to go. Thanks for stopping by, Paul. And who else was in the live chat here? I think I've gotten most of the names here. So, yeah, good stuff. So for all of you who watched us live, we appreciate you being here. We appreciate you joining us each week for Coco Talk. And um, I'm glad that there are other people besides the dozen of us that want to hear us talk about this kind of stuff, right? And for those of you who are still in the call with us now, I want to thank you all for being here. So Curtis Boyle, Grant Leety. Uh, Nick Marentes, Rick Adams, Richard Lorbieski, Mark Overholzer, David Ladd, Ron Delvaux, Wonhon, and Bill Noble, eh? Uh, 
Thank you all for being here. Uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap up episode 21 of Coco Talk. So this will be available for replay on YouTube in a little bit. And it will be available for download on our podcast. But it might be a week or so to catch up because I've only got six episodes on the podcast right now. But coming soon to a podcast near you, you'll be able to hear episode 21 of Coco Talk as well. Um, all right, guys. Thank you. I appreciate you guys doing this every week, taking time out of your day. I appreciate everybody who works on hardware and software and, and provides projects and stuff for us to enjoy and purchase and benefit from. And I appreciate everybody on the mailing list and the Facebook group for, you know, always giving us something to talk about. And for everybody on YouTube who watches us, thank you guys all. Until next week, Coco Talk 21 is signing off. Peace out, everybody. And we'll see you next week. Later all. Later. Goodbye all. Bye.